I'm going to call this meeting of the Quincy City Council Finance Committee meeting to order. Uh, first, I'm going to read the open meeting law or into the record. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or a video recording of this public meeting or transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived, by those present and are deemed acknowledgeable and permissible. And I'll ask the uh, clerk of committees to read the roll. Councilor Andronico. Councilor Kane. Present. Councilor DeBona. Present. Councilor Harris. Councilor Liang. Present. Councilor Mahoney. Present. Councilor McCarthy. Councilor Pamucci. Chairman Phelan. Present. Five minute members. Yeah, five members, we have a quorum. Okay, at this time we'll, we're gonna start off. Um, I'm gonna make two points, two things that were uh, because of conflicts that will not be going on tonight. One will be the emergency management budget and the other will be public buildings. They have been moved to Wednesday night. Um, so we're gonna get started right with the first uh, item on the agenda, and that is the education budget. We have a superintendent here, Kevin Mulvey, to introduce it. Good evening, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. Kevin Mulvey, the superintendent of the Quincy Public Schools, joined um, here with me tonight is Mr. James Mullaney, our business affairs director, as well as the assistant superintendent, Aaron Perkins. And of course, I wanna thank them both uh, for working with myself and other members of the SLT in putting this um, very solid um, budget together for the Quincy Public Schools. I also, of course, wanna thank the mayor, of course, and the school committee for working with us and supporting this budget. And of course, I wanna thank you, the city council, who year in and year out support the Quincy Public Schools tremendously, uh, not only during these budget times, but also throughout the entire year, and in particular with regard to the building of our new schools, in particular your support on the Squanum Elementary School. Um, with that, I'll just uh, make a few initial comments and just quickly go through the budget process and how we develop our budget, and I'll, then we'll ask Mr. Mullaney to take you through um, the budget that we have um, for um, the next fiscal year. Our priority for this particular budget, as always, is student-centered and then staff-centered. And we always look at our class sizes to make sure that our class sizes uh, continue to be the envy of the South Shore. As you know, uh, many of you who have served on the committee, uh, on the school committee, know that our class sizes has always been a, uh, an area that we are very, very proud of keeping those class sizes small for our students so they have um, the very best opportunity to learn uh, from our ex excellent educators. So class size uh, throughout this budget has been the priority and at every level, K through 12 and pre-K as well, our class sizes are in excellent shape based on this budget. We're also focused this year on our social emotional well-being of our students. The last two years, as you know, has been a great struggle uh, for many of our students getting through COVID and struggling with uh, the educational challenges that were associated with uh, the pandemic. And we wanna support our students and our families want to make sure that we support our students to the best of our ability through providing the best social emotional support that we can. You'll see in the budget, budget lines for psychologists and the uh, school um, counselors as well um, that will support uh, the student support program that we have here in the Quincy Public Schools. And um, I have to thank obviously all of our school staff as well. Our educators, our counselors, uh, our custodians, our bus drivers, our bus monitors, our food service, everyone has uh, come together as a team to help us get through the last two years and continue our mission of giving up the best possible education to our students. And um, with that, I'll just quickly go through the uh, budget process. Uh, the first area that we do with a regard to budget is identify areas of consideration which are vast within the um, school department. As I said, everything from bus transportation to curriculum to paraprofessionals and of course to our educators. Uh, we review, reorganize, re reorganize and um, put together options to address possible areas of impact. And of course that's done by myself and the superintendent's leadership team. Again, prioritizing areas that best um, align with the opportunities that we can give our students to maximize their educational potential. We prioritize possible areas of increase and shift if necessary 
as well as reduce if necessary in one particular school where student population may be down and shift to a school where student population may be up. And we certainly did that in this budget analysis as well. And of course, we determine impact on budget areas and lines, uh, again, through a uh, line by line review, uh, working with our principals and our SLT um, in determining, uh, obviously, priorities uh, for improvement and for sustaining uh, programs moving forward. And of course, then we present our options to the school committee, which is in process. Uh, and of course, we're here tonight to present the budget, a bottom line budget to the city council for your consideration and approval. After that, we will then go back to the school committee to prioritize options that the school committee feels are important to work within the budget that you set, rework options, act on those options, and then implement a uh, final budget uh, for, for the fall. Uh, the next chart is a chart that you're probably very familiar with. This is our budget priority chart. And you can see that in the center of this chart, as always, our priority is the students and working out to support our academic classroom teachers, academic programs, academic support, non-academic support, subsidized programs, academic expenses, and non-academic expenses. Again, the center of our prioritization has always been and will always be our students and our staff. With that, again, I thank you for your consideration tonight on the approval of this budget, and I'll ask Mr. Mullaney to walk us through the presentation so that you know point by point um, what we propose for the, uh, for the budget for the next, next school year. Mr. Mullaney. Thank you all very much. Uh, what we do is we highlight uh, those areas that we've increased or decreased in our budget. So for this year, we're starting off with our school budget. It's $126,439,644. This represents a $6,149,463 increase over the prior year budget. And the budget comes from two main sources. Uh, last year, there were three, so there's a reduction in one. The first is the uh, mayor's appropriation and has to be approved by the city council of $1,120,839,644, a $6,549,463 increase, 5.73% uh, over the prior budget, of, um, or the appropriation rather, of $114,290,181. Uh, additionally, we have projected circuit breaker funding of $5.6 million. This is a reimbursement for our special education expenses through the state that comes directly to the schools. Unlike the Chapter 70 money, which goes into the general fund, this goes to the schools um, to directly spend on special education expenditures. That's a $600,000 increase. And the uh, CARES Act, uh, the ESSER 1, uh, was for uh, two years. We expended a million dollars in both years uh, to try and offset costs in the budget. That is expired, and we fully expended those. We still have the ESSA 2 and ESSA 3 going forward, and there's a lot of uh, expenditures, uh, especially touching on things like the social emotional, uh, that will be uh, funded for the next three years. But this budget basically deals with uh, the amount appropriated from the city. Uh, we look at the prior year's approved budget of 120 million. Uh, we added in our negotiated increases, which are the percentage increases uh, from last year. Uh, net of our breakage uh, would need an additional $1.9 million. So if we were to have everything stay exactly the same, uh, we'd be needing $122 million for our budget. Uh, we have 5.6 in the offset, so we'd need a $116,647,996. As you know, the budget before you, or the appropriation is $120,839,644. So this gives us funds of four. Point two million dollars to uh, build our budget. What this allows us to do is to meet all our contractual obligations for this year, and again adds uh, four point two million dollars uh, to support our other areas. Going right into those areas, we're looking at academic classroom teachers. Uh, we're proposing an increase of four point two positions for academic classroom teachers. And this addresses uh, serious needs at several buildings, uh, North Quincy High School, uh, six academic teachers, uh, Parker, uh, two additional teachers, 
and um, Southwest two additional teachers. Uh, the remaining six positions are funded by, as uh, Superintendent Mulvey said, shifting of uh, schools that have a reduction in their class size. We're able to move positions around, so we're looking for basically 4.2 positions. And unlike last year, when uh, the city maintained all the potential raises for contract negotiations on their side, part of our budget uh, includes uh, raises or potential raises for fiscal year 2023. Uh, so we're setting aside $1.6 million in academic classroom teachers for raises. Moving on to academic programs, there are a number of increases in these line items. Uh, we're requesting an increase of a 0.5 art teacher, and this is to meet the contractual obligations for professional uh, staff time and prep time at the elementary level. Uh, one ELL, English language learner teacher, to address the needs in the growing population. An increase of uh, 1.0 ARC Ed, or Chapter 74 teacher. Uh, it's 2.5 positions, one at Quincy High School and one North Quincy to make it a full, um, full program for the health services. Uh, one phys ed teacher, again, to address contractual obligations for prep time at the elementary level. Uh, increase one and a half special education teachers to address needs in that area. And again, setting aside uh, funds for salary increases. For academic support, we're looking uh, for adding one psychological professional, uh, as uh, Superintendent Mulvey alluded to. Uh, that would be an adjustment counselor uh, for Southwest Middle School. Uh, we're increasing uh, 0.45 uh, for our assistant principals. These are previously funded through Title I. Uh, the funds are not available right now, so we're going to shift those positions back into our budget. And we're going to increase a 1.0 for a non-teaching assistant principal uh, in another Title I school. That would be Montclair. Uh, so the um, person who is the non-teaching assistant or will have a, a, a teaching, a, a non-teaching assistant principal there and will have to hire another teacher to take up uh, that position. We're looking at uh, an increase of five special education paraprofessionals to address the needs in that community. And again, setting aside funds for potential salary increases. Uh, for non-academic support, we're looking to increase uh, one paraprofessional. Uh, that's at the middle school level. All of the middle schools, with the exception of Broadmeadows Middle School, middle school has a uh, paraprofessional in the office, and this will bring parity to all schools. And again, set aside funds for uh, salary increases. So in summary, uh, we're looking at uh, 4.2 academic classroom teachers, addition to our budget, uh, five academic program teachers in total, an increase in 7.5 uh, academic support positions and a one non-academic support position for a total of 17.7 positions. And that would use the uh, $4.19 uh, million dollars also included in that obviously is uh, the potential for raises uh, in this current contractual year. And if we look to the chart that we began with, uh, it shows that we did focus primarily on uh, where we're spending our money closest to our, our students. 44.81% of the increases we're looking at going to academic classroom teachers, 31.18% for academic programs, 19.12 for academic support and 4.89 for non-academic support. So we don't open up to any questions you may have, questions or comments. On the budget, uh, Council Yang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, how are you? Um, I have a few clarifying questions, if I could, um, and just four uh, different items. The first is just uh, in going through this now, um, the, the book in front of us. Could you just go over some of the technology requirements that had to change between last fiscal year and this fiscal year, obviously considering what's been going on with the pandemic? I know um, a number of outside resources have helped to you know, provide some technological support for students and for teachers. Um, I also just want to take a moment to credit the fact that all of you uh, probably worked with very limited resources to do everything you can as well, um, to be as creative as possible to provide those tools. So first of all, thank you for doing so, but of course, um, codifying the need moving forward, right? I don't imagine that um, students aren't still in need and teachers still aren't in need with uh, sort of moving forward, even though they're back in the classroom, right, for some technological needs. So could you just talk a little bit about 
what some of those changes might be coming into this fiscal year? Well, I mean, it's been a multi-year approach to this. Uh, the biggest concern, obviously, uh, was in 2020, we ended the class, uh, actual in-person classes in uh, March of 20 uh, to get ready for uh, school reopening in uh, September 21. Uh, there was a huge push. And uh, again, thanks to the city council and the mayor, uh, we were able to get uh, 7,500 Chromebooks out. This enabled all our students uh, to, uh, through, uh, I think it was grade three, through high school to have an individual Chromebook that they could use with them uh, for remote learning and in classroom if they were doing the hybrid. In addition to that, uh, the city, um, through uh, Ryan's uh, office, uh, updated and uh, expanded and really uh, built out the IT's uh, infrastructure for the schools in particular. Uh, we, through grant funding as well, we uh, added a, a large number of hotspots for those individuals who did not have uh, internet access at home. While we're not looking for an increase in technology in this budget, we have a very substantial amount that's being uh, funded through ESSA uh, III. So we're looking at not only uh, adding technology, I think uh, $2 million worth of new technology through ESSA III, we're also looking at curriculum materials, uh, $2 million. Uh, the loss of learning um, and emotional support. We're looking at spending approximately a million dollars a year over the next three years for summer school, as well as after school programs, uh, in addition to funding for ELL, uh, special education, and other needs. And uh, I'm just talking plain numbers. If you want to hear the heart and soul of it, Erin Perkins is here to, to tell you uh, uh, what those programs actually are if you're interested. Oh, I appreciate it. It's a, it's, it's a question of, um, yes, I'm just out of interest, right, curious as to what is going to be sustained, um, even though folks are back in the classroom, um, but because we're here discussing the budget, um, I'm more curious about if there are any um, funding requests that have come in and would be, you know, would stay essentially in this budget moving forward that came out of the pandemic, if that makes sense. So you said there aren't any increases to the um, IT line? Correct. Not, okay. for, not for this year, because uh, mm -hmm. we've got a, a forward window three years out with the ESSA funds to be able to meet all our needs. Uh, and hopefully we'll build the infrastructure in place that uh, I, th I think in the future we'll have to increase our technology lines, mm -hmm. uh, but not to the extent uh, that we have uh, because we'll have basically a baseline of, of everybody having the technology they need and it'll be a matter of maintenance versus uh, purchase. Great. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, the second question I have is just, uh, could we just get an update? I'd love to learn a little bit more about the DEI position um, that was created and if it's set here in this budget or you know what we should anticipate moving forward with that sure so the um, dei position is nearly complete um, we have an offer on the table to a candidate um, and we're just waiting to um, get a response from that person we should have hopefully have that by the end of the week um, we put together our um, edi job description with the help of the citywide edi uh, subcommittee as well as mrs perkins and other members of the slt and principals uh, we put together a pretty comprehensive um, job description. We had about 20 candidates. We interviewed probably about 15 of a vetted 15 candidates, and about five or six of those candidates went through the final interview process. And as I said, we do have a, a candidate that we have an offer to, and we're waiting uh, for hopefully an acceptance so that we can move forward with that position. Great, and that's reflected in this budget as well? Yes. Great, I wonder which line item? Oh, it's, we, uh, oh actually, that's it's actually ESSA. ESSA funding for three years and then will be baked into our budget. Gotcha, okay, thank you. Um, then the third question I have is just for staff transitions and updates. So I said that you um, you know, are increasing some full-time and part-time positions. Um, are you seeing still, uh, like based off of that, is that, you know, do you anticipate that's going to help fulfill the need at least for this next school year? Because I know, again, just with the pandemic, right, we're still seeing the ripple effects of that, and I um, can understand that there were a lot of staffing shortages between trying to find substitute teachers coming in, um, obviously having full-time and part-time teachers coming back, and so, you know, the budget you proposed to us anticipates that it's going to help to cover any of those upcoming shortages potentially, correct? We do anticipate that. Obviously, during COVID, we did have, obviously, because of the 
quarantining um, rules, we did have a number of staff out at any given time. So there certainly was a challenge. Uh, at some points, we even had members of the SLT, including Mrs. Perkins, teaching classes uh, during the height of the pandemic. Um, we've seen, uh, obviously, a market decrease in that since the um, pandemic has uh, waned, and hopefully it will continue to wane. Um, but certainly we uh, believe that the budget that we have established for our substitute line will certainly be enough to cover that. Um, we also used ESSER money uh, last uh, year to fund um, highly qualified substitute positions. Um, I believe there were about 10 of those positions and that came in extremely, um, it was, they were extremely valuable positions in that we could use them to plug gaps where uh, absences, um, and it could be, you know, an absence of anywhere between 10 and 20 days, depending on the circumstance of each individual case. So those highly qualified subs, which were established through the support of the mayor and the school committee, were extremely helpful in uh, helping us uh, get through the pandemic. If necessary, we can use similar strategies moving forward. But certainly our sub line um, is um, in good shape for that in the coming upcoming budget. Um, if I could use this as a public service <coughs> announcement in that we are looking for bus drivers and bus monitors. That has always been the case even before the pandemic, but certainly when the pandemic hit, it certainly took a toll on our um, bus driver fleet. But we did obviously, again, through the support of the school committee, we were able to seek outside vendors to cover the uh, absences of bus drivers so that we did not have any interruption in transportation for our students and we'll continue to use those strategies moving forward to make sure that proper transportation is available for all of our students. I feel like he Maybe you're that connected to me that you know that that actually segues into my next and final question really well. It's about the bus drivers and uh, <clears throat> looking at the, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, the driver's line here um, for just the salary budget, the summary that we have in front of us. Thank you for providing that, by the way. It says that there wasn't an increase in the driver's line or the transportation line. So is it the shortage of the bus drivers that is not allowing you to increase the number of um, bus lines that you currently have? Um, there so let me just sorry, give you some background. I just had a couple of requests come in um, where parents were curious about, you know, hey, could we start a bus? And I know we've spoken about that, and we tried to find ways to make it work where um, some families were asking, hey, you know, their kid is, like, just on the line where they're um, not close enough, but, like, just far. You don't need, like, in that sweet geographic spot where they couldn't get um, a bus stop close to their home. And so my question is, is there, you know... Is, have, have you seen a need, and is there a possibility of increasing bus lines um, for the next school year? And if not, is it because of the shortages of bus drivers? Or you know, if you just walk me through, that would be helpful. If you notice, the, the number of bus drivers stays the same as well. We have budgeted uh, positions more than uh, our actual staff right now. Okay. And that's why we've gone from uh, four buses doing approximately seven routes uh, this year and we had seven buses doing 14 routes in prior years because we had such a need for special education. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a decrease uh, through the pandemic in the number of the people who are driving buses. Uh, so we do have those positions already budgeted in there. So um, if, if we can hire up to uh, the amounts in the budget, we, we've been looking at all those areas. So we have not uh, cut back on the number of drivers at all. Uh, it's just, it's been, uh, as he said, the public service announcement, uh, superintendent mentioned, uh, we're looking for drivers, uh, paraprofessionals. It's it's the great resignation has obviously affected schools as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, we can't you know add to any line items up here. I um, would always advocate for you know increased transportation opportunities. Right. Um, I, I saw that again in the summary too that there was gosh a, a huge increase um, between last year and this year with enrollments. Right. As you know, the last few years had been like. What is it like 0 0.27, 0 0.02, 0 0.57? Last year there was a decrease in this, there was an increase of 2.48, so significantly higher, which is amazing, right? There's more families moving in, there's more students um, going to the schools, and understandably so, right? You're making it desirable to do so. Um, so, you know, again, we can't add to it. Um, if there's any way to um, advocate for constantly, right? Like a greater access for transportation for students, that'd be amazing. And, you know, I just want to thank you again for putting that plug out there if people are interested. Um, and coming in and being bus drivers, they can just reach out to to you, Superintendent. Call my office directly. Be happy to take that call. Great. So those at home, please spread the word for us so we can get our students to school. Thank you. Um, and just a lot. That, those are my four questions. But really, just thank you, truly. I, I, I it's not placating, really. I, I want to be honest in saying that you all have been working. Um, I think 
under circumstances still, right, that are just unknown to folks, and then trying now to uh, support the students and teachers as they come back into schools, and it, it can't be easy, and I just want to thank you so much for, um, for leading the way that you guys have, so thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Council President Zabona. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Superintendent Mulvey, Assistant Superintendent Perkins, and Jim Mulvey, thank you for coming in tonight with your presentation. Um, it's always good to see you. Just thank you for all your hard work over the last year with the COVID-19 pandemic still, and it's still lingering on as well. Um, I appreciate all your hard work, perseverance, dedication to the staff, the teachers, and the students. Um, you know, um, I see that there's 5.0 um, new for special education paraprofessional staff, which is great. I know that every year, um, being on the school committee some years ago, um, you go through a punchline and every year you say, um, what do we need in certain areas? Uh, what's the classroom size? How many kids do we have in each school? Um, what do we have for teachers in that school? And you, and you basically find out where you can put the improvements in. It's a great um, presentation that you have here in front of us. We can see where the funding's going towards. Obviously, you got the school committee to obviously vet in on what they want to um, do. Um, I know over the years, um, we've always had the issue of uh, enrollment. Um, how is the kindergarten classroom size looking uh, this past year coming into the next? I know it's hard to predict going into the new um, 2022 September, but how are we doing this year compared to the last few years? Uh, very good question, actually. So we started our kindergarten enrollment um, earlier this year, and our numbers, um, I haven't looked at the numbers today, but our numbers are going to be very, very healthy. Um, but we have, obviously, enough staff to make sure that our kindergarten numbers stay within school committee guidelines for school committee, um, for uh, class size. Um, but uh, we do have um, an early and uh, very robust uh, numbers on kindergarten attendance coming for the fall. But we will be prepared and we will have <coughs> appropriate staffing for all of those students. I know we're right around just under 10,000 students total. What is, the, do you have a hard number on? What are we at, 9,900 and something? Or? Yeah, we're almost at, we're, I think we're about 40 short of 10,000. Awesome. So around. You know, 9,960 or thereabouts, but we have 30 students currently right now in the register process of uh, central registration processing. So we could hit that 10,000 mark possibly before the end of the school year. I see that. Every year I ask this to Jim Mullaney is, um, what are we doing for retirees? Do you have a, a punchline or are they going to wait till uh, the very end? Do, you, do we have a number? Uh, yeah, for, for this year, uh, it's budgeting a larger number than the past, uh, typically somewhere around 12 to 18. Uh, we're looking at 24 retirees for this year. Wow. Uh, and last year, it was even larger uh, with uh, the number of retirees, uh, leave of absences, and resignations. Again, part of the you know, great resignation. Uh, so there was a great deal of budget uh, breakage in this budget. Um, so uh, we're fully looking forward to staffing all of those positions and more. Um, but uh, in the current year's budget, we're looking at about 24 wow. uh, of the professional staff uh, retiring for this year. Wow. Um, obviously, we, we know underway is the Dr. DeCristofaro Special Education Center, which will alleviate a lot for, for out of district and giving the parents the option. I know we don't have Paul Hines in here today tonight with the public buildings that we when do you think um, a punchline is for when we're going to be going into that center? So I believe the last lesson we had would be two years from this September. Okay. And um, myself and Mrs. Perkins were uh, directly involved in that center and the development of the plans of that center, along with um, Westling Architects and, of course, Paul Hines. And um, I believe Mr. Hines is scheduled to give a presentation, an update to school committee um, before the end of the school year. Uh, we're just coordinating the um, the date for that. And when you do see those plans, you're going to be extremely impressed. It is an impressive facility, state of the art, that will be um, a model throughout the state for um, educating um, students with autism. And um, I think you as a city council will be extremely proud of that facility. We certainly are extremely proud uh, of that facility and can't wait for it to open and uh, service the uh, students of Quincy. It will bring students back into the community that should be in the Quincy community. Students that have been outplaced will be returned to the Quincy 
community uh, to a facility that is state of the art, and that's something we're extremely excited about. I know Mrs. Perkins is, is excited about that as well, being the former uh, director of special education. So we're looking forward to that and having the opening ceremony, hopefully two years from this September, or perhaps right. maybe even earlier in the summer of that year. I'm most certainly looking forward to that as well. Um, just wanted to say, you know, thank you um, for all your hard work. I wanted to give a plug in for North Quincy's quiz team. They won the uh, uh, GBH quiz show this recently. They haven't won it since 2013 out of, you know, 13 teams and high schools they beat. So congratulations to North Quincy High School. I'm proud of you guys for doing that. Very impressive. Yeah. Very impressive. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to approve the budget. Motion has been made to approve. Um, right you. now, I know there's other councils that want to speak, and I'll go to Council Mahoney. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, thank you, um, Superintendent Melvy, Perkins, and Mr. Mullaney. It's nice to see you guys. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Well, first of all, I, I always want to thank, because I ask every year in the Council that they break up full-time employees, and one of the things I love about the Quincy Public Schools budget is you do that for us, so we know what our 22 full-time full -time employees were versus what your 23 asks are so we can see where it's coming from. And it's very valuable for the public to be able to see how many people work for our administrations and most importantly for our schools. We don't get that breakout on the city side and I think it's, um, it's something that we miss um, the opportunity to be able to share with the public. So one of the questions that I had was um, in the high school, I know that we're having, we're offering um, Quincy College courses. How many teachers teach those courses? Six, yeah, about six. Six, six in total? At, At each school? school? So 12. And those are Quincy Public School teachers, right? Yes. And do they get stipends? Do they get a stipend from Quincy College, or do they get a where do they get the stipend from? They get our, a stipend from Quincy Public Schools. From Quincy Public Schools. So they get an additional stipend to teach Quincy College credits in the schools. And is that all they get, or do they get any additional pay for teaching There's college. professional development that goes along with that, okay. um, but the stipend would be for what they're doing for early college. And that's, uh, is that the early, early is that the early college classes or is there's two different types, right, that they can take? I'm sorry? Is there two different types of classes they can take? Is it early so, college? Yeah, the, so there's dual enrollment, there is early college, um, high school, um, so there's, um, but they're all in the Quincy Public Schools. They're not, they're not going to Quincy College to take the classes. They're sitting in your classrooms. There are Quincy Public teachers teaching these classes, correct? Correct. And being paid by Quincy Public taxpayers to pay for these classes. The uh, for early college, we have a five hundred thousand dollar grant from State Street. Okay. Um, so the that funding is coming from the grant. For the early, for that's the early college. Correct. And then, and is that something that's being renewed every year, or is it something that we believe we have a three-year commitment from State Street for a total of 1.5 million over three years? And when does that is is this the second year that you're in that, or is it the first year? Uh, we're in the first year right now. Okay, so we're we'll we'll moving into the second. Okay, and the hope is that that will continue in the or, or potentially grow. We're hoping that it'll be a sustained um, funding source. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that um, State Street. Uh, would like to continue this program for many, many years to come, and we want to make sure it's successful here in Quincy, so we're doing our very best to make sure that it is successful and that the funding will continue. Absolutely. I mean, I don't doubt that you wouldn't be doing that in our Quincy Public Schools. I, I was in the school committee. I know how hard you work to make sure you're not going to put a program in that's not going to be successful for our students, and if it's not, then you reevaluate re and figure out another one that would be. Um, so I just wanted to mention that because obviously there the, are teachers and they're, they're, it's a great opportunity for our kids. However, it's an opportunity that, that you know, it's, it's being paid for by the taxpayers of the city of Quincy through our Quincy Public Schools. The other question that I had was in your non-academic expenses, I noticed your natural gases, your, your level of funding, your natural gases. Um, is that, has, has, do you have to negotiate this, that you, this year or is it, because I noticed both for electricity and natural gases, it's staying about the same. Um, we we um, we were discussing uh, very diligently about increasing that line item. Mm -hmm. um, we've we've had in the past our uh, school rental, uh, uh, the revolving account for school rental covers two things: custodial salaries for the overtime as well as uh, overhead, which would be utilities. Uh, so mm -hmm. we've had a, a significant decrease in that. Uh, we are, are anticipating an increase in the uh, rates right now because our contract, the city's contract has ended. Yep. Uh, we're probably going to be about $150,000 in deficit this year. Uh, we went um, 
we're looking at next year again, uh, watching all our expenses. Uh, and if we're on track for deficit, uh, we'll be looking at cuts in other areas or savings in other areas to cover it. Mm -hmm. um, we felt pro, uh, programmatically that uh, there were certain things that we really needed to get in there, mm -hmm. the academic classroom teachers and what have you. Um, so we're, we're, we're very confident uh, that that and the electrical line uh, will be covered uh, in this uh, budget. Um, if we have to do some shifts uh, mid-year, we'll do those. Um, we always uh, maintain a certain amount of uh, expenditures towards the end of the year. Um, a lot of it is curriculum material. That at this time, we, we buy a lot of curriculum material for the next year. Mm -hmm. uh, and those funds would be available again this year. We're fully expending them uh, yeah. right now. So um, I'd like to see that, that line item increased. Um, I can tell you, uh, you lost I've that been battle. here for 19 years. <laughs> it's never gone up. No, I know. Um, and the we've reason always why found I, a way to pay for it. I know. The reason why I ask that is because obviously that's something that we're all dealing with out there. And, and, and it's, you know, I... I I, I know that that's a line item that you watch very closely, Mr. Mulaney, because well, on the school committee, we were doing the same thing. And obviously, we want to make sure that we're putting all our dollars into the classroom to educate our students. Um, but at the same time, we actually have to make sure that we're making it comfortable for people to be able to, although, you know, with COVID, they have windows open everywhere, right? So, <laughs> so maybe we don't need as much heat. Um, I do ask that question, though, because that's something that... Um, you know, you've maintained and you've maintained it over the last several years. I know that the contracts are coming up and I was just curious to know where we stood for that. Um, and I also know that you guys do your budgets quarterly so you can see where the money's going. So if we run into a problem, we'll know, you'll know sooner than we might know on the city side, but but I appreciate that. Those are really the only questions. Uh, the last question, that's not so true. I'm, I'm following Councilor Yang's. So that reminds me of one other question. She mentioned um, classroom sizes. So I know that you're saying you're maintaining the classroom sizes. What about the space in the buildings, and, the, and particularly in the elementary? I'm hearing that they're very, it sounds like almost every elementary is crowded. <laughs> um, we, we, which will be good for this year. Um, as the population increases, obviously, we'll be looking at. Um, Potentially, uh, you know, revamping space. I have to say that Paul Hines in the um, city buildings has really, particularly at the uh, Montclair School, has really helped us with regard to recapturing unused space. The basement uh, at Montclair, they, if just as one example, they completely renovated that and made it into um, first class space for our students' classrooms as well as uh, a library. So that's just one example. But mm -hmm. As we obviously, this is something we're evaluating all the time to make sure that we have the necessary space for our students. Because you're right, we can, you know, maintain class size, but if we don't have the space, then that's just another problem. Yeah, right. it's getting tricky, I would imagine, because it seems like our numbers are growing, and um, you know, but our space is not. You might be able to be creative with. I mean, I remember being creative with spaces and losing library spaces or losing stage spaces or having to share spaces while, you know, yeah. a class with Jim going on at the same time, which is not conducive to, it can be art, but maybe not math, but it's, it's very difficult. So I just was curious to know. Yeah, we're looking um, good this year. Yeah. Um, and we we're kind of used to being extremely creative. We had to be extremely creative during COVID because yep. of the distancing requirements. Mm -hmm and making sure that we got all of our students in while maintaining the, you know, the six foot, three foot distances. Yeah. So, but um, no, we're constantly evaluating it. And um, is, it at, is it at all schools? Um? Uh, it's not at all schools. Okay. No, there are some schools that, um, that are obviously tighter than others. But um, as I said, for instance, like Montclair was one of our tightest schools, but because of the basement renovation there, it opened up. Mm -hmm. classrooms that we in space that we weren't able to use previously that we can now use as classrooms so that's just one example but it's uh, something that we're looking at and, but we're looking at it at all levels so that okay. there are no surprises mm -hmm. and so that when September comes we pre will be prepared and mm -hmm. we will have the uh, necessary space to obviously maintain our classes and our small class size well I thank you very much I know that it's a challenge I know you've been challenged with COVID I mean I don't think there's I know that you know it is difficult and it's difficult for teachers. Teachers have a tough job because, you know, it's, it's, they're, it's mandatory they be in those classrooms. It's hard to teach remotely. Hopefully we never go back to that again. But at the same time, the ability to be able to switch up and do what they needed to do was very impressive. And the same thing with the, the, your administration to be able to do that too. So um, I, I do thank you. I appreciate the budget. Like I said, it's, it's, 
I'm, I was just spoiled because I started on the school committee, and you do get to see, it, it's very easy to look at this budget and understand how many people we're talking about, where we're talking about, what the impacts are going to be, what the costs are going to be, and how things are going to be broken out. So I appreciate that very thank much. Thank you. And I agree with you. We can't thank our staff enough for everything they've done over mm -hmm. the last two years. They really have gone above and beyond. So thank mm -hmm. you for pointing that out. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Uh, any other councils on the motion? We have a motion on the floor to approve the education budget. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed, seeing none. Thank you, Superintendent. Thank you, Thank you all you very much. Thank you to the staff Thank you. for showing up tonight. Okay. Next on the agenda, we're going to be doing the, uh, the police budget. Chief Keenan. Good evening, yeah, councillors. It's good to see everybody in person. It's been quite a couple of years. Uh, I'd like to say, though, on behalf of the Quincy Police Department, it's been a challenging two years or so, but we've risen to the challenge. We've provided all the services required to the citizens of Quincy without interruption, and we look forward to getting back to normal operations. Uh, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to present the budget, the 2023 fiscal budget tonight to you. I'd like to thank the mayor for his continued support and financial support. In crafting this budget, I think it's a, a, very, a very good budget and I think it's very reasonable. If you look down at some of the lines, most of them have an increased or have minor increases. A lot of the increases are due to uh, contractual obligations with the, uh, the various unions that we reached over the last year or two years. Uh, we are asking for new positions in the patrol, for patrol one, the patrol offices. Uh, what, the reasoning for that is we're budgeted normally for 175. We're looking for 180 positions to be budgeted. And the reasoning behind that is that we anticipate a number of retirements in the, in the coming year. As, as a, may, you may or may not know, it takes a long time from the time that we call for a list to do the background, vet the offices, get the offices through uh, training, get the offices through a six-month academy, and then it usually takes us two to three months of uh, in-house training and field, field training to get them up and running to be uh, actually on their own in productive offices. So we're looking at this budget, trying to get ahead of this situation and get ahead of the curve. It's a very challenging uh, situation to get academy seats. We have secured academy seats in Randolph and in Plymouth. The academy starts the end of one of the academies, I believe it's in Plymouth, starts at the end of, uh, end of July. And then the academy in, uh, in Randolph starts right after uh, uh, Labor Day. So we're trying to get those positions filled so that we don't work at a deficit. Over the last number of years, it takes so long to get these people through the system. By the time we get them hired, vetted, and onto the street, we're already at a deficit and we're looking to hire some more. So I think with uh, what we're intending to do here, I think it'll at least keep us up to the curve. We may wind up having a hire in the next year uh, as a result of um, retirements. We do have a number of retirements coming up that we know there are several that uh, offices that will be aging out, myself included, in the, in the upcoming year. Captain Dugan, I know, is leaving in July. Uh, Lieutenant Glenn, they're not aging out. They're a little younger than me, but uh, they'll be, they've indicated that they're going to retire in July. Lieutenant Glenn, who runs two divisions, and Captain Dugan, who's the senior executive officer in my office. So they'll be sorely missed, and it'll be very, very difficult to, uh, to fill those big shoes. I've also asked for a couple more positions in dis a dispatch center. A dispatch center, I believe, is at a, a critical, uh, critical place right now with uh, the burden of calls that they, they take every single day. My goal is to add one um, to each one of the shifts to alleviate some of the pressure down there. Uh, we haven't hired dispatches in at least 20 to 25 years, and the job has become an awful lot more sophisticated. When we first used to do this, we had the same amount of dispatches. When a call came in, you'd write it on a card. You'd slide the card down a belt, and the dispatcher, who happened to be Chuck's father at one point in time, uh, would take the card, he'd read it off, and give the call out. But um, it's, been, it's so much more sophisticated. Uh, we're also now a primary piece app, which means that the calls don't get rooted on a cell phone to 911. They come to us directly, which has increased our call answering, not necessarily the calls for service, but call answering by over 20,000 um, calls throughout the year. They have to be answered. Sometimes it's a hang-up call or a, a dial, misdialed call or whatever, but they still require an answer. 
So we're really at the breaking point down there, which is why I've asked for those positions to be funded. Uh, other than that, the, the budget, there are a couple of line items. We, um, I asked for a little bit of an increase in training because we're now required through the post standards, we're required to use our firearms and train on our firearms and qualify twice a year. We always did once a year out of the Boston range, Boston police range. But now we, we're, we're required to do uh, two, two trainings a year, so that comes at a, uh, at a price. I also asked for a slight increase in the court budget because with all the delays over the, the last two years with the court system and COVID, they're catching up. There's a huge backlog of cases that I anticipate are gonna go forward in the, the next fiscal year, so we have, to, we have to make allowances to address that. Um, I don't believe that I have any, any other great increases other than some of the costs that go along with uh, the academy and the new, the new offices that we're going to be putting through academies. Uh, the new dispatch position, we actually do get grants that offset some of it, so the taxpayers of Quincy aren't bearing the whole burden of that. We have $370,000 that our grant writer, who does an excellent job, Christine Hurton, she goes through searching for various grants throughout the year to see if we can offset some of our own uh, tax base, uh, tax funding, uh, and we have a, a grant of $370,000 that offsets some of the dispatch positions. So that's basically my presentation. I'll be glad to answer any questions if I can. Any councils? Council Yang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good evening, Chief. How are you? It's good to see you. Good evening, uh, Council. Um, you answered pretty much all of my questions that I had written down already, so I was like frantically writing as you were going through the um, presentation. So thank you. Uh, it, it was just about the increases again, you know, with the patrol line items, um, telephone operator. Um, I'm happy to see that the overtime line item is actually increased this year. As you know, every year you come in front of us, we can't add to it, right? Uh, before, you know, every year there's always unknown reasons. You have to, uh, you know, address them in the overtime line item. Typically when we look um, at previous spending, it's always over what was budgeted and you still always come back in front of us with the really conservative ask to say that you're not increasing it. Um, and this year you are, and I appreciate that you're, you know, sort of looking ahead and saying, you know, okay, we're, we're finally gonna do a little bit of an increase this year. That's great to cover that. Um, for the increases though, for the patrol line item and the operator line item, you said you're adding on staff to meet the need. I was just curious, could you just explain though, between the fiscal year 21 budget and 22 budget, you actually went down significantly in those. This year I understand the increase, but can you just explain why there was a decrease between well, 21 and 22? When a, a lot of time, what, what happens is when uh, we hire an officer, he goes into patrol one. Patrol one is a lower paid category. After he gets on a little bit of time, about a year, then he goes into patrol two. He gets the salary increases that go along with patrol two. And then after the third year, he'd go to patrol three. So it fluctuates, depends on when the officers are hired and when they reach their milestones with, um, with their hiring date. So that fluctuates a little bit in there. So sometimes, like you see the patrol one, we anticipate hiring this coming year, they'd be hired into patrol two. Some of the other offices uh, aged out and went to patrol three. So that, that explains the, the fluctuation there, I think. Okay, all right. Um, again, you answered all of my questions already in your presentation. Um, I just want to acknowledge, um, I had you know talked to the superintendent earlier about um, the conversation around DEI and um, I think it's important to acknowledge that that's something that's also been uh, very front of mind for your department as well. And um, I just wanna thank you for the standards that you have set for your department. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge that in this space, right? And frankly, every opportunity that we have to do so, um, you know, these past two years have been really difficult for everybody for very different reasons, right? But particularly for me, what a lot of conversations that were brought to my attention were obviously, um, you know, the concerns around particularly the senior population with the API community. Um, and I remember, um, unfortunately, when those horrific attacks happened, uh, right, there was a lot of call for a lot of different things. And I remember picking up the phone and talking to you and just saying, you know, there are some folks who are afraid to, you know, my parents, my mom, my aunt included, right, to just mm -hmm. walk their dogs at night. Um, and immediately you said, you know, we're going to increase patrols in that area. We'll make sure that there's a presence there um, so that community feels safe. And you didn't hesitate, right? And that's one small example, but Chief, I just want to acknowledge it's an important one, right, to say that so many communities, um, don't reflect the work that you're putting out there, right? Um, I've talked to other folks in other communities as well um, who uh, work in other police departments who are always like, hey, is Quincy hiring, right? <laughs> They're always looking to actually come to the Quincy Police Department um, for so many reasons. And again, that's that one example is just one example of the reasons why I think folks um, are eager to join the police force here, are um, comfortable being here, reaching out to us, right? And, and why we're comfortable reaching out to you. And um, it, it's not, 
ever easy, but it certainly hasn't been um, these last couple of years. So again, I just wanted to take a moment tonight um, and use this opportunity to acknowledge, you know, the great work that you're really setting for your department. Um, I want to thank everyone, obviously, all the men and women who serve in your department. It's it, it's not without effort and intentional effort that we've been able to get to where we are in the city. So thank you for that. And um, with that, I'd like to make a motion to approve. Uh, motion to approve on the floor. On the motion, Council Mahoney. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. I'm not sure if this is going to be a question for you or for Mr. Mason, who's in the back of the room, because I don't think, um, I think I just have a budgetary question, and I'm highly doubting that it has anything to do with the way well, you do math. He's a lot smarter than I am, so. What's that? Um, well, I'm just noting, I mean, I did notice that you transferred money from court time into overtime, because you did fall short in your overtime budget, and that's perfectly okay to transfer that money. I think I had a question about your court time last year, because you upped it, but, and, and it looks like who knows, it could be COVID, but I know if I could just ask Mr. Mason, I'm not going to, I'm going to come back to you, but if you, Mr. Mason, in the budget book, I think you said that, um, please note fiscal year 2022 reflects 3% city and school-wide raises. Is that correct? Uh, correct. That is noted. Okay. So one of the questions I have, I mean, if you go to the bottom budget, it was kind of strange because I always start my budget process by going back to last year's budget, what got approved and, and looking at those numbers. So when I was looking at the numbers and I looked at previous years too, like fiscal 21 and before that, and usually the numbers match up. This is kind of odd because the whole budget book doesn't match up like fiscal 22, um, for the police chief, it would have been 147, but it includes his raise in fiscal 22 to 151. We didn't have an appropriation to move any money into those lines, so it just is odd. We approved a budget, but the numbers don't match. But in your budget book, you say it reflects that. Then we get into overtime, and you have overtime at 950,000 in year 2021. It should be 950,000 in 2022, but it went up to 978. Um, and then it, it looks like the request is to maintain it, but it's actually going up. And the same thing with court time. Court time started at 465. Last year it went up to 565, and now it's 582. So are we just increasing the whole budget, everything 3%? So last year there was a 3% increase, but that was expressed in <clears throat> the, uh, Department 132 under raise and appropriate. And page seven in your book, you have it noted that it's the 3% raises for, pers for, for personnel services, right? Correct. Okay. So you, you include the 3% raise in overtime? Is that, that's my question. Um, in some cases, yes. It depends on how the overtime was originated. Uh -huh. um, in a lot of cases, it is included in there. Okay. Uh, but depending on the, what the base factor for overtime is. So, for example, uh, we'll take court time, for example, counsel. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> so if you see there's a marginal increase to court, court time. Uh, that's because a lot of those officers, it's part of it's part of a cyclical duty, mm -hmm. and so that when we go to the ERP and go to the budget module, that would be picked up as part of that ratio. Yeah, I guess the reason why I'm asking this question is it just seems very odd. In all the budgets that I've seen, I've gone back. I, I I'm just curious because I saw it and I thought, okay, I see your note. I read your note. I got that. But then I went back and saw it. In the past, typically what happens is there's also on the budget book. I think it's on page 29. Of last year, you had a $5 million appropriation for potential raises, and then this year, that $5 million isn't there anymore. Like, it's been appropriated into these line items. Is that correct? And that's what that note's explaining. It hasn't been appropriated yet. That will come at the end of the year. That's to assist in comparing year over year. So I guess the reason why I bring it up is it's very strange. Like, we're doing a budget, but I can't balance the budget because I'm supposed to be doing, I, I have to go back and do math and compare things left to right, and we haven't appropriated money, and it just looks strange. So it looks like, what it looks like from 2022 to 2023 is that we're level setting something. It's not going up, and but in reality, it is going up. And I just, I, I found it kind of, um, and. I know you'll do an appropriation at the end of the year. It just seems very odd in the way it's done because it's not very transparent. It doesn't, it says it here, but it typically isn't for overtime. And there are situations not, Chief, not in your budget. <laughs> so I just want to make sure it's not in your budget. But there are in situations in other other line items that they, the, that you wouldn't have that tip, that that three percent's being allocated and it probably shouldn't be allocated. So I'm just pulling this out because it just, it just doesn't going across the board like that doesn't just make it doesn't make sense and you could go through it and, and we could question it all day um so I'm, I'm i'm definitely having some problems with the way that this is being laid out but thank you very much mr mason for coming up to to talk um so i i did have a couple of questions but i i think you answered my questions too as far as the the patrolman and the the five because so what you're saying is is it's 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 out of our hands in quincy if we want to maintain our staff at a certain point, like the Quincy Public Schools just came up and explained that they that they do a breakage for their their teachers, and they're having a similar problem because they have the 
the um, you know the people not waiting to the retiring and just leaving leaving. Do we see that happening in the police too? Do we see anybody just deciding they don't want to be a police officer anymore before they get to their retirement? Yes, unfortunately, we have. Yeah. With police reform, there was a number of offices over the last year or so that have retired early that were unexpected, mm -hmm. and they attributed to the police reform standards and a lot of the turmoil and lack of support that's going on amongst the, the police community. But uh, they, we did see a few leave, but we also do see a, a healthy influx. Mm -hmm. Quincy's a good place to work. Mm -hmm. Like uh, Councilor uh, Liang said, mm -hmm. there's always people that are looking to come to Quincy because they know it's a good place to work and they're supported. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then so you're suggesting that to you're hoping that with the with the anticipated numbers that you think are going to be retiring in the next year, that adding these five to that list, it's not going to we're not going to be hiring five starting July 1st. It would be at the next hiring. Is that how it would work? It'd probably be, I would say, probably within two weeks of July for us. Probably the middle of July we'll start with in the hiring process. There are some that actually have gone through police academies that are coming from other police departments. So we're getting them trained, which is a benefit to us. We can get them out on the street a little bit quicker. So you're taking people maybe from other other communities? Is that what you mean? But I just Well, they're on the list. They come down on the list, but they are presently police officers. There's, I believe, one in Canton, one in Newburyport or something. They live in the city, but they're on other police departments. Mm -hmm. So, so you're transferring them in from maybe like... You're not transferring. They're actually not. being hired off the list as civil service. Okay. But they're, police but they're not police officers in other communities, or they are? Yeah, they are police officers in other communities. So uh, that's... And to be able to transfer into us, you'd have to be on the list to be able to transfer. Correct, yes. Okay. That's that's one of the ways that, that it's and done. And they don't have to go to the police academy to no, do that. So you'd be able what to they would do is they go through two or three months in-house training okay. with uh, a seasoned officer to acclimate them to the Quincy Police way of doing things. And so would they come in years. potentially as a level one, or could they be coming level in as a level? They, they'd, even if they were someplace else, they might have been a level two. They'd no, they'd be a level one. So they, they come in at police one. How does that work, though? If you're a police officer someplace else, that you it might. Doesn't, it doesn't matter where you're coming from. Once you're, well, you're hired here, you're hired as a new employee for the city of Quincy. So you're hired as a new employee, you start your level all over again. Correct, so. and that would be where they would be hired into. They would they would obtain benefits. You know, the, yeah. I think the average salary, the brand new salary, is between fifty eight and sixty thousand for for a police officer, level one police officer, and then you have to factor in various differentials, various different uh, educational incentives, and that type of thing. Is so that standard? Like, salary. is that standard? Like, if you're coming from Kent, let's say it might be a different salary for them for level one or no? I'm just it, whatever salary they they were making in whatever town or city that they were at, they leave there and they start well, an out pay scale. Okay. Okay, I just, I'm just curious because I, I don't know how those transfers work, but I do know that they do happen on occasion. So they'll be, potentially you'd be able to, rather they wouldn't have to go to the police academy, so the benefit would be that they would be able to start and fill those vacant spots faster. Right. yes. Okay. And then, just out of curiosity, so is this something that would be gone, ongoing, so like you can give five this year and the next year, it depends on your retirements. It's, it could be something that we need to kind of look going forward, or is it something that we can balance out as we go forward? Well, that's why we're trying to hire in advance and get these people on board before we actually lose the bodies, because mm -hmm. once they get through the academy, well, they, we lose bodies every month. We lose mm -hmm. offices to retirement every month. So they'll take those offices' place. So it tries to get us at least up to, up to speed or up to snuff. I don't know if we'll be able to get ahead of the curve. We're attempting to, but... At the end of the day, we'd like to get to that 175 and, and have it actually stay at 175 for a while instead of having to go out and do another round of hiring because it is expensive, it is cumbersome. The background process is pretty arduous. Mm -hmm. uh, we assign offices in the department to have to go out and vet these people, do their backgrounds, take some time and effort. So if we can get the academy seats of the big thing, if we can get these bodies, these offices hired and get them into the academies, we at least keep up with the game. Okay. We're not as far, as far behind as we normally are. Right. right now, we're budgeted for 175. We presently have 164, and I, there's two retirements in July, so we'll be down to 162. And then there's a lot of right, right after the first of the year, there's several more offices that'll be going. Okay. And then my final question, and this is just again, I, I'm not positive about this. I'm not sure if this is across the board for police and fire. Is there a certain age that you can be a police officer until? Yes, it's 65. <laughs> so it is man. So, I'll let so, you know in June. <laughs> so that, that, that hasn't changed, though, right? No, that doesn't change. It's 65. Uh, the offices are required unless they get a home rule petition for some reason to stay. Okay. Um, they're 65 when they, uh, when they have to retire. Yeah. And we have a number of offices that are going to hit that milestone.
But, but I have to say that I know, because the reason why I asked this is because I thought they were part of the police office. Like, but a lot of them do details. And because I've seen people who, that I thought were retired and they were doing details, and then they're like, we are retired. <laughs> so. Well, yeah, they are retired. We, we did bring, and it's been really a beneficial program, we do bring a retired officers. If they retire in good standing, mm -hmm. they'd be allowed to come back. They get sworn as special police yeah. officers. They don't have to have any further, they have to keep it up. It can be very confusing hours. to the regular people out here that just thought somebody retired. I'm like, wait, I thought you were retired. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of them still do come back and, and kind of offset some of their pension. And, and they were a good benefit to us because they allow us to be able to fill some of the details we normally wouldn't. Which brings me to the next question. So details, has that been a challenge for you lately? Details are always a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm hearing that it's hard to get people to do the details these days. Yeah, yeah. This, this What's going younger, on there? <laughs> the younger generation have a little bit different mindset when it comes to work and working extra and overtime. They do a tremendous job for the 40 hours a week that they have. Thank hear. God for those people that retired. <laughs> uh, they, they're willing to work. The retirees are willing. They're old school. They're willing to, more than willing to work. But yeah. you know, some of the younger generation, you know, they're not as in, interested in doing the overtime or the details, but they, they still help out when we need them. Yeah. What happens when we don't, when you can't? get somebody to do it so just again this is just it just doesn't own. get filled a it lot of times we'll just make sure that the uh contract so we wouldn't get it from another like another like we do we, we, we do they're having the same problem we are we, we do go to outside agencies it's first patrolmen and sergeants get the first opportunity mm -hmm. then it's lieutenants and captains they get the second opportunity then it's our retired officers they get the third opportunity and then we go to outside agencies we go to the state police we go to braintree milton weymouth whoever we can get bodies from but they're they're at a challenge uh, so it used to have a problem like years ago that it was the people were begging to get the overtime and now <laughs> there'd be fist fights in the parking lot if somebody got a detail that you thought you're entitled well, to maybe that will change quite the other way maybe that will change again too i just i just find that very interesting so how much has changed but thank you very much chief that's that was really my question because thank you like counselor. i said some people that i thought were retired all of a sudden i'm seeing them i'm like wait <laughs> <laughs> they explained it to me but i just thought thank you all right thank you very much um council president de bono thank you mr chairman chief thank you for coming in tonight um Thank you for all your police officers. You guys run a, a first class police department. Thank you. Um, I, I asked this to the chief that most of the, my colleagues have, have uh, asked you the questions I was looking for, but I asked this to Chief um, Jackson, obviously, and I always ask you every year, how are we, how are we doing with the opioid epidemic? Um, are we been, has it been an increase in Narcanning? Or how has it been in the last year? There's been a slight increase over the course of the last two years with, uh, with um, the coronavirus. So it has gone up a little bit. It hasn't taken a huge, it's not a huge increase, but it's been fairly steady increase. Do you think that's uh, related to, is it slash mental illness, slash coronavirus? What, what are you, th not being able to go to meetings in person, having to do it remote by Zoom? How, what do you think the, the situation is? I think a lot of it plays into it. I, I just think the availability of drugs in, in, the, in society now plays a, a big part in it. I know that a lot of the meetings were canceled in person for AA and, and NA meetings, so that has an impact as well. But uh, I just think in general it's a societal issue. Obviously, we'll, we'll, we'll have to take care of it as, as we move on leading forward. But uh, thank you for all your hard work. I hope you stick around for the, for the ending of it, of your term, of your time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Counselor. I still got a little ways to go. I, that's right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, take a moment of privilege from the chair. Just a question. Uh, Chief, um, superior officers overtime, it kind of jumped from 2002 to, to, to this last one. Is that contractual? Was that? Yes. So yes, they, there was a 3% contractual raise. That's part of what that so is. So that's yes. basically factored into that? Yes. Okay. And having worked with some of your dispatches back when I worked for the city, you have, you have a tremendous group of dedicated people who have been there a long time and do a great job. We do, yeah. Uh, we, we repair. We were, they were always quick to point out things that needed change and needed to be upgraded and repaired. So they're very dedicated. So I'm very happy to see that you're putting another position in that because that's probably one of the unsung heroes. They I really think. are. If they, if they don't get it right, everything goes bad. It, and it, thankfully, they do get it right. We can have the greatest police officers, but if we can't get them to the call. Correct. <laughs> I'm proud so, of our dispatches. And so it, it was always a pleasure working with them in there and highly professional. And I'm glad to see that we're, we're expanding that role, Chief. So thank you. Um, with that, any other counselors? Council Mahoney. Sorry, just, so I just have to go back to that question. That superior officers line, it's 386-250, right? From 2022. And in 2023, it's going up to 501923. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's the contractual raise? 
that's part of the contractual raise plus uh, plus the increases you know the the increase that that we need these these people for different uh, tasks so okay. it has increased a little bit because that's like almost double because it was really 375 last year that's you know 375 to 386 that makes sense that's the three percent but then you've you've gone up almost two hundred thousand dollars on that so I guess it's yeah that was underfunded I believe to begin with Pardon me? That was underfunded in the previous years to begin with. Okay, I'm just going to look that up. Susan, can you confirm that the, the, the superior offices over time, I think it was underfunded, but could we just get that confirmed? We've wound up we, having to transfer money into that account a number yeah. of Are we times. talking about superior offices over time? Yeah. Okay, one moment. It looks like it was um, $33,000 over. So um, in this particular fiscal year, there was $375,000 budgeted. To date, they've spent 418621 So there is a, a de current deficit of 43600 and there is still probably about four weeks left in the fiscal year or five weeks that need to get posted for overtime. So I'm going to assume that that, will, that deficit will increase until we do the year-end transfers, okay. and then the transfer will be made and to cover it. Right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We will, I anticipate we will be on budget this year. I don't believe we'll be over. Okay. We may even be a little bit under. Yeah, I'm just asking because. I'm not I, promising, but we No, know. no, I know. I'm just asking because, as, as I said, like, when that, that was my confusion with the, as asked Mr. Mason, because you can't tie things back and forth when I'm looking at this. It's not, again, this is not your department. This is not your issue. This is my issue with the way this is being laid out. It's hard to be able to track it back and forth. Gotcha. Um, it's very helpful what Susan's provided to us to be able to see what, what's been spent throughout the year. And I have seen that you've kind of had to maneuver your way through your overtime. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion on the police budget. Uh, all in favor? Aye. All opposed, seeing none. Thank you, Chief, but we're we'll going to stay right up there for animal control. Uh, <laughs> mo motion is made, made to approve the animal control bu budget. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. All opposed, seeing none, the ayes have it. Thank you, Chief. Thank you very much, Councils, for your continued support. I know our offices and uh, civilian staff really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, uh, a budget near and dear to my heart. Uh, Brian? Uh, motion to approve. Motion has been made to approve. Discussion on the motion. Council Mahoney. The, the only question I have, and I pretty, I'm pretty sure I know what it is, um, you have a jump in your contractual line item 530303. Um, could you just tell me what that's for? It's for uh, cybersecurity <laughs> services and then a uh, firewall cluster to segregate fire and police from mm -hmm. the rest of the city. Okay. And um, just wireless access upgrades to all the schools, which we're doing because of the Chromebooks. And yep. So, so it's going to segregate the police and the fire from the city of Quincy? Correct. And it's gonna, you're going to be able to also um, put some security on the Chromebooks for the students, is that what you're saying? Yeah, we, we have security there, but just add more wireless access. Wireless access. Because it can't handle all the Chromebooks currently. Okay. And then just out of curiosity, I know that to the um, Quincy Retirement Board, will they be separated from us, or are they still be kind of be part of ours? Their email is still part of our system and their phones. Okay. So in that, and we're just watching that closely, too, obviously. that was a, That's where this all came from. So I just wanted to check on that. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Councilor Yang. Just really quickly, I just want to thank you um, for your, not just your management and how you've improved this department over the years. Um, no offense, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> but, um, you know, because we are at a budget hearing, what I always like to look at, and to Councillor Mahoney's um, point, when, when Susan provides us with, you know, historical data going back years, right, and then looking at this past fiscal year, obviously we always look at, you know, how much have you spent to your budget to date, how much um, have you spent over that might, you know, need more resources, how much have you spent under, do you really need those resources, and your since you've taken the helm, I mean, like when I look at it, you're always like right at what you have to what you need to spend. And I really believe that speaks to um, your management skills on the financial side as well. So not only are you great on the IT side, but just as a manager, I just want to thank you because that always is phenomenal when I'm looking at, you know, actuals and I see um, department heads spending right to what their needs are um, and still getting the job done. I think it's, it, it, it's exactly what we want to see for management. So thank you for that. Um, that's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, uh, any other discussion on the, on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Thank you, Councilor. Okay. okay, next, Veterans Services. A 
I want to welcome you, Director. Your first time, I believe, up before the council. And uh, good evening, counselors. Thank you for having me today. Uh, I'm honored to be here and to um, present the Veteran Services budget in hopes that you will uh, pass and approve. Any, do I hear a motion? Motion to approve. Okay, any discussion on the motion? Council, Council, Council President DeBona. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just Christine, thank you for all your hard work. Welcome to veterans and being the director. You've already been out doing a very good job with the city. Just wanna say keep it up, keep it going. Um, and we're looking forward to uh, another year here. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. All in favor? All opposed, seeing none, thank you. Christine. Thank you, everyone. Okay, inspectional services. Mr. Duca. Thank you, Jay. Good evening, members. Jay Duca, Director of Inspectional Services. I'm here tonight uh, to present my budget. Uh, inspectional services comprise of seven departments building, plumbing, gas, wiring, code enforcement, conservation, weights and measures, and zoning. We issue over 8,500 permits collectively. We perform over 24,000 inspections. We inspected and sealed over 640 various scales, including taxi cabs and supermarket scales. We processed over 100 ZBA cases and over 100 conservation cases. We've answered over 1,500 complaints and issued violations and warnings. We've collected over $8,500 in fines. We have 12 people in court, 20 buildings on our top 10 list. More than top 10, but. Um, we also, uh, as you know, you passed the short-term rental registration ordinance last April. Um, to date, We've monitored over 85 magazines, newspapers, and social media sites. Uh, we've identified and verified 125 STRs, short-term rentals. We have 27 in the application process going to ZBA. We've sent out 44 violation letters just in the resident aid districts alone. Uh, monitoring has shown that 25 of these cases have ceased operations. Um, all others have received a violation letter and an application to register. We've got 12 violators awaiting court dates, two violators are facing arraignment, and the rest of the non-responders are receiving or have received violation letters. Collectively, ISD have generated $4.5 million in revenue. Uh, my proposed budget tonight is approximately a little over $2 million. It includes an extra building inspector um, going forward. Thank you. Motion will approve. Um, on the motion, Council Mahoney. Council, yeah. Hi, Mr. Duca. I just had a quick question. So on your professional tech line, um, it looks like you've gone up. And I'm not sure if this is a mistake, because it was 3,008 in 21, 3,008 in 22, and it's gone up to $33,008 in 2023. Uh, that includes a brand new um, weights and measures scale for gas stations for our weights and measures inspector. Uh, right now, uh, Jonathan's been using pretty much 1950s technology, um, pouring multiple cans of gasoline into a big jug and trying to uh, get an accurate measurement for, uh, to seal the gas stations. Uh, this unit will uh, fit on the back of his truck. It's, um, it's the newest technology. It'll allow him to pump the gasoline out of the tank, measure it, and pump it back in. Um, it'll save many hours of uh, operation for, um, for our weights and measures. And that's going as professional tech? That's, I guess that's what it is. Professional tech, it's, it sounded like it was more like classes that you'd be taking, but, but that's, it just was an on, online place. And your contractual has gone up um, by 25,000? Uh, the 25,000 extra was for our uh, host compliance software, which we purchased uh, sometime in September in response to the short-term rental registration law ordinance. Um, that's the software that we use to identify all our short, the short-term rentals that are taking place in the city. They verify the rentals, how many nights, where they're located. 
they provide us with uh, the evidence that we need going forward to court um, and pictures and revenue that they collect. So that's um, an integral part of our monitoring of the uh, short-term rentals. So that's your software that you purchased, and how did you do it last year? That because your numbers are coming in, you're at eighty percent of your budget last year. Did you not? Did you not use the software last year? Or no? So th we didn't have the audits. We, the audits came uh, was voted on in um, March. It became effective April. Uh, we started searching around to see how we were going to monitor um, and find out where these STRs were located. Mm -hmm. We came across the host compliance software. We called around. City of Boston uses this. Cambridge. Uh, other communities, um, it's really invaluable over identifying, this is how we identify the sites. Mm -hmm. It's not only about identifying the sites, it's about uh, getting the evidence that we need, which they provide us okay. with. And then I just want to call out in this budget too, as I was calling out earlier in the, the um, in the chief's budget, overtime in this particular case um, has stayed level in 2022 into 2024. 2023 in the same time same time with the longevity so the inconsistencies of like some places were going up three percent saying it's a raise across the board and then in other places it's not so th that's where my my question was coming into play it's a little confusing because if you go back and compare 2022 budget to what we approved as a council and what we're having in the numbers here they're not matching up so thank you very much Mr. Duker. you're welcome uh, council yang thank you mr chairman Good evening. Um, I just have a question about two positions on here. So one is the in their existing positions, the assistant building commission commissioner. Um, it, it says that you went 115 percent over last year, but you didn't really ask for an increase this year. So again, we can't add to it, right? But I'm just curious as to why, well, what that position is and why it went so much over last fiscal year, and why you don't anticipate that they would go over it this year. Uh, which which budget line is that? It's our uh, five one two one zero one, the assistant building commissioner. Uh, yeah, so what happened with that was uh, we had hired a plan examiner, which was budgeted last year. I'm sorry. Excuse me? You hired a what? <clears throat> a plan examiner. <clears throat> Excuse me. We had a line item for a plan examiner last year, mm -hmm. and for some reason, that plan examiner was being paid out of the assistant building commissioner budget. Um, I have to make some last, uh, what I'll end up doing is at the, the, before the end of this fiscal year, I will transfer some money out of the plan examiner um, money to pay for that. Uh, I'll that was my second question, was why plan examiner is at zero, and you just, you just answered it. So uh, was that a technical error? Like, how did that happen? That it was uh, I, 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 did, I became aware of it a few months ago, actually. I, I didn't realize that that was happening, but I realized what it was, and I figured at the end of the year, I'm going to make some adjustments to the budget uh, to make that balance out. OK. All right, that was it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. OK. Any, anyone else? Any other councils? President DeBono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jay, good to see you tonight. Um, I think the software that you have for the extra $30,000 well, well spent with getting the court dates and the photos for the short-term rentals. It's been a discussion up here for, for almost two years. We had that thing going. We couldn't, we were, our hands were tied and we couldn't do much about it. We get the legislation up here. We gave you the green light and we put it into use. You've done a great job with that. Thank you. Um, um, some of these items, I think they're much needed as our city grows. We're, we're going to need more oversight. Um, you've done a great job. Thank you for all of the issues that I've had with, with blight properties and all that. Um, with that being said, how are we doing on the blight properties out there? Um, is there any, any particular clusters in the city that we're, we're dealing with? We, we have uh, probably less than 10 that are really bad. Um, we're trying to deal with, I know I've been dealing with council failing on some and we've um, they're on our top 10 list um, we've had help from the Attorney General's office in resolving some of these they um, they send out um, letters under the receivership statute and a lot of they'll get some uh, resolve on some of these but um, there are a few that uh, there's uh, the people are deceased uh, there's no apparent heirs to the property and um, it, it just sits in limo it's just a tough situation to try to resolve some of these. But um, we do have one that we are moving. We're thinking of having the city take it uh, on a tax lien, which would, um, which would help that. So sometimes these are, these are stuck in estates where uh, folks have passed away and the, uh, the, the heirs or the, the, the sons and daughters have control of the house and they just 
living out of state? Is, is that some of the issues that we have with up light properties? Yeah, it's, it's a combination of that and the fact that the, the home is probably not worth a lot of money. Um, and uh, there may be many heirs and they're not identified and it, it, that becomes a problem because we can't really take anybody to court and have a court order um, without a person that we can name. So, uh, but the Attorney General's office has helped us out over the past five years. Uh, they've helped us resolve at least uh, 12 properties uh, just by a letter alone. Yep. And we've had um, two properties that went into receivership where a court actually appointed a receiver to take over the property and develop it. Usually we're up here and we're talking about Ward 1 a lot. So if it's in Ward 5 right now, I mean, over the years I remember many down in Howes Neck that we had to kind of clean up and do um, with, the, with my counselor uh, colleague here, Dave McCarthy. So we've had to deal with that in back to Margot LaForest and her days here. So um, I'm, I'm glad we're down to 10. I usually hear a little bit more than, than a bigger number than that. Um, I'm happy to support your budget. I think you do a great job. You're very good with the folks. Um, you tailor up a lot of the stuff with, with, with emails back to me, back to the resident to let them know we've, we're communicating and we're doing work together to, um, to mitigate the situation and the problem. So thank you for all your hard work. Thank you, Councilman. You're welcome. Council McCarthy. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, <coughs> hey, thank you. I just want to say, uh, reiterate Councilor DeBona's uh, uh, positive comments. Um, thanks for uh, all your help with everyone, especially the ward councilors. Uh, in regards to zoning, CONCOM, the many mornings that we've sat with residents to go over uh, zoning issues or CONCOM issues because most of the folks, it's their first time coming in. Uh, they're not contractors. They're doing some work at the house and uh, you sit down and give me the time, uh, a lot of times, and, and go over a lot of the things that uh, happen down in Ward 1. So. I appreciate it. I'm glad we're adding another body to your small staff because you guys cover a lot of territory, and I know I'm not the only one calling you up about different issues. So uh, thanks, Jay. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you, Councilor. Um, any other councils? <sighs> Seeing none, uh, I'd, I'd just, just like to say one thing. I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank my staff. Uh, they're hardworking, dedicated people. The past two years uh, during COVID, they've been out keeping the city rocking and rolling. So um, I, I appreciate that. I'm very proud of them. Thank you. Yeah, uh, and just a quick thing, Jay, I'm the one who put put together the thing for the short term audience to put a lot more work on you. Uh, saw it doing a number on a lot of residents' neighborhoods where they were going in, outbidding families, outbidding people trying to get into these houses. And I've already seen it's made a dramatic difference in those areas. People aren't throwing them in, saying we're in, we're we're a verbal, we're an Airbnb. You can't do anything to us. And uh, and the neighbors didn't know who their neighbors were. They didn't know who was living there, and there was a lot of problems. And uh, I, from what I've already seen, this has cleaned up a lot. So I thank you and your staff for that. And obviously, I think it's money well spent to put this software in to track them going to court because I know if you're not able to do anything and there's no enforcement. They're just going to keep doing it, and they won't. Um, and it also exacerbates. We we got a housing shortage, and suddenly housing that would normally be used to house people are now now short-term rentals, and it actually um, it exacerbates an over an overheated market already. So the work you've done and the the people have done a great job, and thank you. Thank you, partic particularly on the blight of properties, because I think I'm a weekly caller to you on several of these, and. Um, and a couple of them happen to be in my ward in the top 10. And uh, I appreciate the work you do on them. And uh, hopefully the one you're thinking about taking is the same one I'm thinking about. Yeah. <laughs> on is. North Payne Street, I would say it. Um, okay. But we have a motion on the floor to approve. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank, Thank you, Jay. You. Thanks, Jay. Okay. Next on the docket, we have uh, the Council on Aging. Mr. Clasby, and I'm going to give a moment to uh, to our um, executive secretary, um, Chris Walker. Through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, the body in front of you tonight, you have a memorandum from Director of Municipal Finance Mason uh, relative to a misprint 
in the budget for Council on Aging under the line of social service agent. Um, that number should be 67,208. Um, if it uh, pleases the body, uh, the administration would like to accept a friendly amendment uh, to have that line on and reflect that number um, so the budget is accurately reflected. Motion to accept. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. On the on the budget, any councilors? Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Um, any discussion on the motion? Council DeBona, Council President DeBona. Um, thank you, Mr. Classy, for being here tonight. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for all your hard work, obviously, over the COVID pandemic, um, getting the seniors back into the Kennedy Center. How, how is it looking for participation, I guess I could say? We're almost up to full steam. Uh, and, and my colleague, uh, Michelle Hanley, is here from the uh, director of the Recreation Department. She's done a tremendous job, as she always does, with the Senior Olympics. We're just nearly at the end of the Olympics. We've had another great you know, series of games. Um, but the programs at the Kennedy Center are pretty much up to with the numbers previous to the, the it's pandemic. Good, it's good to hear. Um, how, was, how was the volleyball game? Did, did, did the, the staff win yet, or did the they seniors did, win again? They did, not, they did not win. The seniors won once again. <laughs> I participated in two of those, and they just they cleared us. I cleared house before you, you know. So they definitely um, have the home court advantage. They sure do. But um, thank you for all your hard work. I'm I'm happy and glad that the, um, the the Kennedy Center and all our senior activities across the city and Senior Olympics has been doing great. It's good to see the seniors back. I know I know they probably missed it during the COVID over the first beginning part of it to to go in person. So thank you. Well, we greatly appreciate the the work of the council and your support. So thank you. Okay, uh, Council Mahoney. Just a quick, I guess I have a clarification as you, Mr. Walker, sorry. Um, so in fiscal year 2022, that line item for social service agent would have been $6,500. But as Mr. Mason said, he added a 3% increase, which would bring it to 66,950. But then we realized it was a mistake and we're gonna put in, instead of 15,000, we're gonna change it to 67,208. So what is this person's salary? Is it 66,950 or is it 67,208? Do you know? <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah, I believe it's 67208. Okay. So so this is where I'm having this. I'm going to keep nailing this because it's like it's, it is a problem because we have a fiscal year 2022 budget that we approved as a city council. Numbers are being changed through Mr. Mason saying 3% across the board, 3% across the board, 6,500 times 3% is 66,950. We have an update because there was a mistake, but that number is actually 67,208. That's problematic. Sorry. Can maybe shed a little bit of light on that and clarify, Mr. Chairman, if I can, just, just to amplify a little bit on, on what Mr. Mason said. Essentially, and we've done this different ways over the course of 15 years on how uh, collective bargaining agreements and raises for employees get factored into the budget. It's happened a few different ways depending on the timing of bargaining. Uh, obviously, the last two years have been a little uh, wacky, to say the least. Um, so last year, we were in the middle of negotiation at that point. Um, and we put in the reserve for appropriation. Uh, throughout the course of this fiscal year, uh, the council did approve that reserve for appropriation, which we didn't talk about at that time, but that was worth the 3% raise. That was the $5 million um, that was in the budget from last year. Correct. 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 Okay, just moving sure. Just want to be so on the same page. What would be required this year, uh, as throughout the course of the year, would be to basically make the bookkeeping transfer from the raise and appropriate into the individual line items. Mm -hmm. uh, as of the end of, when we got to the point of printing the book and doing the budget, actually it was, it was me that suggested, so you can blame me, not Mr. Mason, um, yeah, that <laughs> we, haven't done, we haven't done the actual transfers, which would come through this body to actually transfer the money that was approved into the individual lines. Uh -huh. um, but for display purposes and clarity purposes, we actually thought that it would be clearer if we showed what the transfer will, will look like when that bookkeeping measure is done via this body at the end of the fiscal year. Uh -huh. So what we did was we took the five million, et cetera, what, that was approved by the, the council, uh -huh. and we filtered that in to the budget to show what 
that number will, will actually be once we complete the end of the year transfers uh, as we do every year. Uh, again, admittedly, uh, this is the first time that we've done it like this. Um, I know, Mr. Mayor, we did include a note in the budget book mm -hmm. sort of highlighting this fact. Um, I don't know if that helps to clarify a little bit, it, it, Council. It, it doesn't. It, I'm sorry, because I went back. I understand what you're saying, and you're saying we do it different every time, and I've been on the Council for quite some time now, and I went back and looked at the budgets, and we've never – it usually is what's approved and appropriated from prior year forward. And then we have a transfer of funds that actually adjust those salaries. So I agree that this is different. And what I'm trying to say is that in this particular case, because the note that's in the books is 3% across the board, 3% across the board would be 66 950, which you have here, but it's actually 67208. So it makes me question the numbers, what we're looking at. And I'm just going to keep pointing it out because this is a this is a professional budget that's being put before us. We're supposed to be do, do, doing our due diligence. I apologize. I haven't really been doing as much research as I normally do. So you're getting me a little bit rough. So, you know, thank goodness. But thank you very much. I appreciate that explanation. Um. I'm also going to, the auditor has a point to make. She just wanted to. Okay. Uh, just so that the council knows, the current salary for that position in fiscal um, 22, which includes the 3% increase, is $66,950. What this amendment does is it it makes that, that number whole, but it's at 52.2 weeks. So the number that's coming up is... Um, is exactly 67,208. So the number that you will be voting on, just to let you know, is the correct number. So I guess that actually causes a big concern because the number from last year to this year, some of these numbers are going up exactly 3% if you do the math across the table, which I've been doing. It's, it's, it's okay, it's just, it's just, it's not, it's, it's as clear as mud in some ways in this situation and it's just an odd way to do a budget. So thank you very much. I understand the transfer, the transfer makes it much easier, but you took money out of a, a line item that was in the budget from last year. We haven't actually, made the, we actually have not approved that transfer yet and that's also missing from the budget book too. With the assumption we will make that appropriation probably in two weeks, so thank you. Okay, um, any other councils? We have a motion. To approve as amended. As amend, we need a motion to approve as amended. Yeah. Oh, you made that. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. All in favor? Aye. All opposed, seeing none. The ayes have it. Thank you, Mr. Clive. Thank you very much, Councilors. All right, next item traffic, parking, alarm, and lighting, better known as TPAL. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Finance Committee. Thank you for having me and giving me the opportunity to talk before this body tonight. <clears throat> you find before you the proposed budget for 2023 fiscal year for the Department of Traffic, Parking, Alarm, and Lighting. There are several changes I'd like to highlight. In personnel services, we're proposing a restructuring of several lines to better reflect current staffing levels and department needs. We're proposing the addition of an electrician position that would bring us to five electricians in the department. We are also proposing the addition of a payment out of grade line item. In an effort to make these changes in a way that is as close to budget neutral as possible, we have proposed the elimination of two positions, a parking control officer and a parking special constable, who are the employees that typically have collected um, tickets and uh, done the booths at the service lots. All their additions to personal service items are contractually obligated increases. Uh, the total net increase for personal services is $15,185. Our contractual line items are proposed to remain level funded for fiscal 23. We will see an increase across five categories in our expense section of the budget. We are requesting an additional $100,000 spread across five accounts, maintenance supply, crosswalk painting, vehicular supply, public work supply, and bike lane improvements. These increases will allow us to keep up with the rising cost of material and also allow us to do more to better serve our residents every day. Overall, 
the proposed TPAL budget for fiscal 23 is requesting a net increase of $115,185, which is an overall increase of 3.5%. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay. Um, Councilor Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ed, we can, let's take a sigh of relief. You did it. I'm nervous. Well, I know. It's okay. I'm nervous. Yeah, yeah. Welcome. Welcome to the jungle. It's good to be um, here. How's the new role going? It's great. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's challenging, but I'm very happy to been given the opportunity to do it. Well, you have a great team, and I appreciate all the work and responsiveness that you provide uh, to Absolutely. the residents of the city. I just want to make sure Allie has everything she needs to continue doing her job so well as well. Uh, she's been a great addition to the team over the past couple of years, and some of the improvements that we see have been very helpful. Um, so yeah, I just want to say thank you. I want to uh, just make you more comfortable up here. Thank and you. And I want to make a motion to approve. Thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Motion has been made to approve on the motion. Council Mahoney and then Council McCarthy. That'll be nice too, I promise. Yeah, I'm very. <laughs> I can take it, I promise. I know you can. <laughs> We've had conversations, we have. Um, so I do have a couple of questions. So with all the development that's going on in the city of Quincy and everything that's happening, oftentimes we hear there'll be no impact to traffic. What do you think of that as being the head of traffic parking in the city of Quincy? I think what we all, all we often hear is there'll be no significant imp impact traffic. Um, I do think that obviously there are, regionally there are more cars on the road than there's ever been. Um, at our busiest intersection, we're seeing improvements, imp I shouldn't say improvements, increases um, from pre-COVID levels of over 6%. Mm. Um, so generally speaking, there are more cars on the road than there ever have been. Mm -hmm. um, what we are, what we are doing and what we are working with these all these developers to do is to try to mitigate any sort of increases that come through requesting um, whether it be pedestrian improvements or money for signalization improvements um, we're doing our best to to handle the traffic that's moving through our city every day okay. I know one of the conversations that we had was that it was a transit oriented development down in North Quincy mm -hmm. and as we both know that didn't work out so well because the developers were selling the condominiums to people who were buying it without the realization being told that they could get parking stickers but they really couldn't get parking stickers right. um, but that I still haven't got that list as to which ones are the transit oriented development oh. so yeah so I guess my concern there is that you know things get passed in zoning things get passed in planning with these types of things being said and then and there's no follow through to the developers, no clauses in the condominiums that are being sold saying that they cannot have those things. And that causes some real tension for new residents that come to the city of Quincy, plus residents who are dealing with the traffic in their neighborhoods. Sure. So, I mean, that is, and we, we, and we discussed that at length. Um, so I'm hoping that we'll have, and if that's something that we need to help you with as, a, as an ordinance, we'll have to work on that as well. But that is definitely something that's a big concern with the development that's happening here in the city of Quincy. And I think that's where you're kind of seeing maybe administration or different departments not actually talking to each other or just assuming you're going to be able to influence those types of things. And it's leaving people, us, the city of Quincy, um, vulnerable because, you know, those people that move to the city of Quincy also have a right for those things too. Um, one of the questions I had for your supplies in the back, um, I know you're asking for $20,000 for each. And, and I apologize, I didn't have a ton of time to be able to look these things up today. I, I do appreciate all the, the, all the stuff that's sent to us. Um, but I think in the, I think in the office supplies, you're at hundred percent. Most of them you're at hundred percent. What, um, how much more do you think you're going to be spending in those line items for crosswalks, painting, you know, vehicle supplies and those types of things? So I, I think we're comfortable with what we have left for the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. um, in those line items, uh, we have done most of the purchasing that was done early is, um, you know, our traffic posts, our electric supply. Uh, we kind of shift into painting this time of the year where mm -hmm. there is some money in crosswalk painting mm -hmm. to cover that. Um, so we are not anticipating running over in any of those line items. Okay. But you're anticipating next year you will because of the increase of costs? Is that what the... That's correct, yes. And what's that based on, just out of curiosity? You're just, are you just giving a flat rate saying $20,000 for each line item? Or are there certain ones that you're more concerned about than others? Uh, I'd say, generally speaking, the increases that we've seen with the products that we buy, they're generally 20 to 25 percent more expensive than they were two years ago. Uh, I will say our contracts that have come back for line striping, um, for supplies at the, the light warehouses, those prices have all gone up, and those are based a long time out of uh, state contracts. Uh -huh. um, 
I would say our, our biggest concern is the traffic signal equipment that has had the biggest jump. Um, I think it's mostly based on the, the metals that the equipment's made out of. Which one's that, just out of curiosity? You have maintenance, crosswalk painting, is it the vehicle supplies, or which line item are you talking about? We buy a lot of our traffic signals out of maintenance supply. Is that a line item in here that I'm missing, or is it the signal accessibility improvements, or? Uh, the line I'm, I believe you're talking about, are you talking about traffic signal maintenance? Yeah. I'm asking you, you said that it's one of That's, the... So those are contractual line items. Okay. Those are the money that we pay our on-call contractors mm -hmm. to, um, to make improvements to the signals to address critical repairs, um, that sort of thing. Okay. And then I think this was in your budget last year, park and garage operations, that 300000 what's that? That is for operation of the garage. It's for payments to priority parking as a third-party vendor that is staffing the garage. It's for um, paying... For maintenance, uh, for instance, we have a pump system in the garage that we make uh, repairs and improvements to. Uh, that is actually coming up pretty soon. We have a substantial uh, enhancement to that pump station. Mm -hmm. um, and then it also pays for the, uh, you know, we get power washing done. We wash the windows. We have the uh, all the electrics in there we have serviced by. Aldon Electric usually, um, so just to keep the lights on and everything running well. Okay, and then my last question, um, parking receipt offset. Um, last year we were at, um, 2021 we anticipated 600,000, last year we were at 900,000, and in 2023 you're not anticipating an increase of those, you're not, you were anticipating just 900,000 again. Yeah, that, that stays, we're keeping that at the level it's at. We are anticipating uh, surpassing that amount in revenue that comes in. Mm -hmm. um, I. I believe that we just felt comfortable leaving it at it, its current level so that to account for any sort of fluctuation if things were to change with COVID. I would think that would be, are, are, what are we seeing for the for the garages now? Are we seeing an increase in the use of them or for parking? Yeah, we both, we're seeing both an increase in the transient parking rate and then also there's a lot of companies uh, in the area, businesses that have come back. What about the new General's Bridge area that I notice you're, you're collecting fees over there too? How many, what's the fees that you're collecting over there? For in parking? The, the pay station? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've, that's not as well used as the garage. Um, we have collected this fiscal year, I believe, $30,000 in the pay station that lot. Is that part of the parking receipt offset? It is. And that's new, right? That's Th new, that's yeah. That's the $30,000 new, okay. So I would have anticipated that going up as well. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome, Council McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Good evening, Ed. Hello, sir. How are you? Good. Uh, no, thank you, as Council Kane said, to all the work you've done for me in Ward 1. Uh, you guys, uh, as soon as the work order goes in, it gets done. The people down there recognize it, so I appreciate it. Happy to uh, I know we've talked a lot about crosswalks. Sure. And one of the things I know that you wanted to do, which was a, a smart move, is to um, paint what you could paint but hold off on some of the major... Uh, locations where that rubberized crosswalk comes in, yep. which I, you know, of course, it's more durable and it will last longer. So uh, I appreciate that when that happens. And I know that you have a healthy list um, down in Ward 1. Also, uh, I appreciate the work on the C Street project that's coming up in a year or so with the state. Uh, the sit-downs with Ali and yourself and myself uh, in regards to going down C Street from Ginger Betty's down to Palmer, which includes new lights, new crosswalks, all kinds of great things. Um, and I appreciate that because we, we kind of picked that apart and we'll be due for another community meeting on, on that uh, very soon as that's going to come up on us. Yeah. In regards to the traffic, um, if anybody thinks Quincy is going to stop being a cut through for Weymouth and Situate and Hingham and put 53 and 3A out of business, forget it. I don't think it matters uh, what we have here. Cars come through here. They've been coming through here. It's just kind of flexes. Back in the day, it was probably two cars at a household. Now it's probably four. So everything is uh, definitely increased, and uh, uh, you guys do a great job. Uh, keeping everything flowing here in the city. And uh, if we could stop Weymouth and Situate, Hingham and Cohasset from coming through, I I think we would see a, 
a traffic decrease. We'd do it in a heartbeat if we could. I don't think there's any way to get around that unless we pull everybody over and start checking licenses. So, Ed, thank you, and thank to Allie and, and the whole staff down there. Uh, um, great job taking over for Mr. Cassani. We flowed right, and we didn't miss a beat. So, thanks, Ed. Thank you very much. Any other counselors? Seeing none, the chair will take a moment of uh, privilege here. Um, just one concern on your budget. It's not. A, it's a good thing because okay. I, I see an area going down that I, I'm a bit concerned with, where it's this parking control officer, mm -hmm. and we lost the parking control officer. I know I have areas around MBTA stations, down around um, business districts, and you know them because I call you weekly. Absolutely. Uh, I'm just a little concerned. Are they still going to be able to cover those areas? Because it's now become a little more than just the uh, the business area. There are other neighborhoods that are getting inundated from parking. Sure. Sometimes it's the people in the business areas parking in all day in their um, in their neighborhood. And those, particularly the streets down off of Elm Ave and stuff like that. I'm a bit concerned with. Do we have enough to cover? I think we do. Uh, we've been staffed at five for the majority of the fiscal year. There's been some improvements. Um, we are switching over to a new ticket processing software, um, which has an enforcement piece of it that allows the officers to kind of work in tandem a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, in the past, it's been a little cumbersome. You had officers that could be chalking in the same car. Um, that sort of thing goes away, um, which is a tremendous help to us because we're not doubling our efforts in, in these business districts. Um, I, I believe that we are handling the parking in the residential sticker area as well now. And um, I think that we've been doing it at five and I expect Holy to be able to continue to do a good job doing at the be, new staff be level. Into it. Yeah, because these areas, you know, Hospital Hill, particularly I'm looking at down uh, around the Wallston Business District, um, up around here, the Quincy Business District. I mean, it's temptation to go park on these side streets and they become clogged for emergency vehicles and it needs it needs enforcement. So um, so as you're going to see you say you're going to be able to do it, and I, I'm glad to see that. But it's it's more saying I'd like more money in your budget to put more yeah, parking I mean, control offices. I appreciate that's that all. because I think it is a, a need that goes beyond just the business districts. These some of these neighborhoods really need the help, and um, and I know I've called you in the past and we've had them, but I think. If we leave it alone, it's just going to come back and tends to come back quickly. Yep. And I'd like to see that number go up to more, more money so we can give you more money in your budget. But uh, so write lots of tickets in those areas. I want you to write a lot. Absolutely. Um, okay. And uh, just one other thing, the, the payment out of, out of garage, 15000 out of grade, yep. That hasn't been anything. Is there a reason for that or just? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's... Um it's something when we split off from the DPW, it's a line item that I think should have come with us and it never did. So there's been a couple of circumstances over the past few years where um, due to absences, injuries, that sort of thing that you need to pay employees uh, at a higher grade this to is do a, the duties. This is giving somebody a temporary position that like they, they're next in line and they become the... Yeah, if there's a working foreman right. that was out injured, the, somebody would then be somebody asked to, to step up. Um, and we, we haven't had a function to do that mm -hmm. in the past, so we're just looking to... That's sort of a housekeeping item to have that going forward. Okay. Well, thank you, Ed. Uh, great job. Um, we already have a motion on the floor. Do I hear any other counselors? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Thank you, Ed. Thank it you very much. Bad, was it? <laughs> no, you know what? <laughs> Started off worse than it ended, so I uh, I just like to take a minute to thank all of you, to thank the mayor, Mr. Walker, Mr. Mason, and uh, my wonderful staff. Uh, Allie Rule is as good as it gets for a traffic engineer, and we're extremely lucky to have her. All of our junior engineers and all parking staff, everybody. So thank you. Look yeah. forward to continue to work with all you guys. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Um, next on the agenda, uh, Natural Resources Department, uh, Ms. Murphy. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the council. I'm honored to be joined by some members of my team uh, this evening. We have uh, Michelle Hanley, our uh, recreational director, Eric DeBoer, our program coordinator from the recreation department, Mr. Scott Logan, uh, our general, currently our general foreman for the cemetery division. 
We have uh, Julie Sullivan, our environmental scientist, Paul Doherty, our program manager, and Mike Castanelli, our project manager. Also in the room with us tonight are uh, head golf pro Tom Ellis, um, office manager Diane Bowman, and Justin Bosquet from the uh, golf superintendent from Furnace Brook as well, too. Um, very honored to lead uh, such a quality team of professionals. Uh, in the, tonight's budget before you tonight is uh, funding for our, as I mentioned, our nationally recognized recreation division, uh, our free summertime play, uh, playground program, our fantastic winter gym program, uh, folks that oversee our camps, our clinics, uh, our prevention first uh, events, and a whole wide range of uh, phenomenal offerings uh, from our recreation division, and one that I think uh, with your continued support uh, has been recognized nationally by the National Park and Recre uh, Recreation Association. Uh, these are also the resources that go into uh, maintaining, preserving, and enhancing our 52 park locations, our six cemeteries, 75 locations under the uh, control of the park division, which include memorials and traffic islands. Uh, our 10 city beaches, um, one of 20,000 street trees, uh, two ponds, and uh, I'd be remiss if I did not mention the work that Julie did uh, with the support of this council down at Butler's Pond uh, recently. Um, I know that Council Fallon is eager to take the next step towards Sailor's Pond, and I'm sure uh, we hope to be back soon before this body uh, with a plan to uh, restore Sailor's Pond as well, too. Um, these are the resources that support events such as uh, the Quincy Arts Fest, which we enjoyed this past weekend, uh, the Quincy Senior Olympics um, done by the Recreation Department, our Flag Day Parade, which is upcoming, our Clean Arena, which happened recently, uh, our Downtown Concert Series, or in a range of other community uh, events as well, from Pride Day to Memorial Day to Veterans Day to our school festivals, the Community Fourth of July events, and, and much, uh, much more. Uh, also in our budget tonight um, is uh, resources to support the operation of the Furnace Brook Golf Course. Uh, I'm very uh, encouraged uh, by some of the work being done uh, there uh, by the entire staff, but in particular at the uh, management of the financial picture there done by Ms. Bowman and Mr. Ellis. Uh, the revenue uh, uh, for the uh, fiscal 22, the, first six, the last six months uh, of the fiscal year of the first six months operating as missile course are very strong. And we are projecting a surplus of approximately uh, 200,000 for that first six months, due in large part to the way that we collect our uh, membership fees um, up at Furnace Brook. We are projecting a surplus going into fiscal 23, which should more than offset the requests uh, for appropriation associated with the Furnace Brook golf course in this budget. Um, for the first time in history, we recently lost, launched an online booking system. Um, folks uh, from the public that want to golf up at Furnace Brook you can go on FurnaceBrookGolf.com or our uh, department website on the uh, city website and book a tee time and get to enjoy a course for the first time. I'm proud of the work that they've done up there, opening up the course um, to groups like the Quincy North Quincy Girls um, golf team this spring. Um, the work that Michelle was planning with the Quincy Youth Golf League, uh, Quincy Senior Golf League, and an adult beginner league up there. Uh, we also have the new Quincy Firefighters League up there as well, too. So um, we've really uh, wasted no time in tapping into this as a, a community asset that folks from Quincy um, can really take advantage of. Uh, also in this budget um, is uh, an important line item that I appreciate the council support in the past, and that's for uh, the planting of uh, street trees. Uh, last year, um, or this current fiscal year, we were able to plant 551 uh, new trees and uh, with a partnership with the uh, DCR Green the Gateway, who planted an additional 400 trees, that brings our new tree to tree removal ratio. We did have to remove 170 trees last year through our forestry division. Um, that brings our, uh, our city uh, planting to removal rate to 3.24. Uh, and combined with our project, um, Green the Gateways, partner with DCR, uh, that's 5.8 new trees planted for every one removed. So uh, that's good progress. Some other highlights um, of this budget, uh, I do want to draw your attention uh, in the cemetery uh, division. I did send out a memo to the council, uh, but we have a couple of uh, additional requests this year. We have a substantial uh, increase in requests for overtime, due in large part to um, uh, kind of uh, the way that funeral homes have responded to COVID. They have stretched out uh, the way they handle wakes and funerals, so many of them are not doing uh, two wakes at the same time, which have created a substantial increase in our Saturday burials. Now, uh, the city does receive additional revenue for Saturday burials that goes into the general fund. It does not go into the cemetery department. Um, so we're looking for some additional overtime funds uh, to account for the fact that our cemetery division has really turned into a six day a week operation. 
we have a request for groundskeeping supplies, uh, primarily to uh, address uh, an issue that's come up um, that we're going to address anyway, but came up at one of the Pine Hill meetings relating to um, the barrels uh, that particularly exist at uh, Mount Wollaston Cemetery. Uh, we'd like to replace um, some of the old mishmash of 55 gallon drums, uh, some of the old aluminum barrels with a, uh, a much more appropriate um, a barrel for uh, the surrounding aesthetic environment in Mount Wollaston. Uh, the other request we have is a, a job reclassification uh, from General Foreman to Superintendent of Cemetery. Uh, this position is uh, quite different from the other general foreman uh, listed in, in uh, local 1139. The responsibility is to meet with their families, um, to lay out plots, um, to participate regularly in the cemetery board of managers meetings, uh, to manage the budget, uh, to handle discipline. Um, it really is something that we've been working on for a couple of years and are suggesting it uh, through the budget process to be changed this year. Relative to the uh, park division budget, uh, pretty straightforward as it relates to personnel, a couple of positions moving within the budget, um, but nothing uh, too new uh, or exciting, uh, and there shouldn't be any surprises in the, in the park side as it relates to personal services. We are looking for uh, additional funds in the contracted line, uh, both for the work being done uh, by our downtown coordinator uh, and as it relates to our stump removal. Uh, we have a number of stumps throughout the city. I'm sure the council will see them. I'm sure you hear from constituents. Uh, we do uh, use uh, primarily outside contractors to come in and do the stump grinding. It's uh, messy and expensive work, so it's easy for us um, to use uh, outside uh, contractors to do the stump grinding. We typically do that. Um, in July and then again in the winter, depending on uh, what we have on our list to be removed. But we do have a backlog of stumps that we'd like to uh, get to, so we're asking for more money in our contracted line uh, for stumps. The downtown coordinator is looking for uh, more money um, uh, for her work, um, in large part due to increase in uh, the cost of some of the chemicals associated with the uh, fountains in our downtown, uh, in addition to the uh, two uh, additional parks that we've picked up over the course of the last year. Um, and uh, the amount of maintenance that goes into um, keeping the benches, uh, the fountains, and the other um, components of those parks uh, in good working order. Um, I would uh, also bring your attention to uh, the tree pruning and removal line. Uh, this is another area that I think we are currently underserving the public on. I'd like to uh, work uh, with the council uh, to uh, identify additional funds so that we can get beyond our uh, crisis management, if you will, in urban forestry and get into uh, urban forestry management. Uh, some of the other comments that we've heard over the course of the last number of months, including our friends uh, from the Forbes Hill uh, Park uh, organization, is that the city isn't doing enough to uh, do preventive maintenance um, in some of our park uh, properties as well, too. And quite frankly, they're right. Um, and we're looking for uh, some additional resources um, to handle both our backlog of requests for street trees as well as uh, doing some uh, very targeted and specific uh, park projects to include the Forbes Hill Park. Um, there are some slight increases requested uh, in our expense line to uh, reflect uh, some of the costs that we've seen uh, going up, but uh, those are relatively minimal uh, compared to some of the other lines uh, that I've requested. So um, with that, Mr. Chairman, I can take any questions. Okay, um, like to go, we have three different budgets and we'll start with the cemetery budget and then work to the next one. Um, so starting with the cemetery budget, any councils? Council McCarthy. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Murphy. Good evening. Um, and thank you for the rundown. I wanna go over that a little bit more. Uh, we talked brief, well, we've talked a few times and I know we've talked briefly uh, today the, the move on uh, the superintendent um, is what it changed from a union position to a management position. Is that the change? Yes, essentially. It's going to happen. So. so one of the uh, important factors that I did not highlight is that, um, you know, as the general foreman, that particular individual is working essentially six days a week. Um, and the take-home pay uh, for last year alone was uh, approximately 134000 um, so, uh, needless to say, there were quite a few hours being put in. Uh, so the salary change, though it looks like a big jump, uh, when you look at the overall compensation package, um, it really isn't. Right. No, I, I, I just wanted to clarify that. I, I, I thought I understood that, and that's, that's what I, uh, I got out of today's conversation. And then um, I just see some 
juggling of uh, titles, uh, labor sprayer, and we talked about uh, labor heavy machine operator, I think. We flip-flopped a few places, and um, it looks like also the, uh, the number we talked a little bit, cemetery maintenance man, they were just more or less classifications in regards to titles down to labor or gardener. Correct. I see yeah. some of the numbers just moving around. Yeah, it's an appropriate uh, allocation of funds between the existing titles as they stand today, Council. There aren't new positions to be added. The only change on the personnel line is the reclassification of the title when the general foreman is superintendent. The rest of the positions um, are the same. There are three labor gardeners and, and three cemetery maintenance man uh, uh, maintenance positions. These um, this budget more accurately reflects those costs and those lines. Yeah, no, uh, no, thank you. Um, Mr. Logan and uh, his staff uh, do a wonderful job at both Mount Wallison and Pine Hills. Uh, they're available uh, and they're, um, they're all pretty much local guys. So they're very, very understanding to the families in Quincy. The majority would are going to Mount Wallace and Pine Hills, so it's uh, it's great to have them on board. Um, not only will folks reach out to them, but they'll reach out to folks that they know to take care of things. So I, I think it's kind of special to have that staff up there uh, and what they do. So I make a motion to approve the cemetery budget, Chairman. Motion has been made to approve uh, on the motion, Council Yang. Good evening, Dave. I just have a quick question about the uh, mention of the um, the increase of staffing due to our, you know, having to have Saturday services. But you said that there are also revenues that come back in from those, and it goes into the general fund. Just logistically speaking, I don't know if this is something that you can answer, or if Eric has. To, I don't know where he went. Maybe Mr. Kwok would answer it. Um, so, like, we, we just looked at TPAL, for example, right? And there are offsets that come into the budget for revenues that come into TPAL. And so, logistically, you could be. I guess, would it be possible to have those be an offset to this budget moving forward? Or like, why does it go into the general fund, right? Like, why couldn't we make it go into this department specifically for an offset? So again, I don't know if, who would be able to answer that question, but I think that would be fitting, right, to put it back into the budget. I, I think it would make sense, Councillor, only because it shows that there is revenue. If somebody didn't have the context that I just explained, they'd look at the budget and think that we're taking a giant leap on overtime without that explanation. I'm not saying it's dollar for dollar, but it would have been helpful. Um, I don't know if we can uh, do that. Um, I defer to Mr. Mason on that. Um, but um, I certainly think that it would certainly tell a, um, a more clear story about uh, why we're looking for that increase. Yeah, is that something we can do? I mean, again, it all comes back to the city coffers, right, in, in some way, but it just yeah. logistically speaking, Ms. again, to your point, right, it's just more accurate if it's placed back into yeah. this specific budget. Yeah. Mr. Walker has an answer if that's... Go ahead, through, Mr. Walker. Through you, Mr. Chairman. I believe we can, Councillor, um, going forward. I, I think it would be something, um, you know, we, we could talk about putting it into next year's budget. It's not uniform across the board mm -hmm. in terms of what we show uh, as offsets. I think we've, quite frankly, gone away from that historically in, in some areas. We still maintain, we just went through the, the parking offset. We maintain that. Um, we maintain the hotel motel tax offset for the tourism department, but there have been a number of other areas historically where we may have in the past shown offset and have taken those out of the budget for display purposes. Um, it's for, Mr. Mason can comment on any technical differences but from a practical standpoint, it's six and one half dozen of the mm -hmm. other. And if it helps this body to term, make a better determination, we're happy to, to go forward, I think, um, barring anything um, formal that we can't do, um, I think we'd be happy to, to have a discussion about it. Great, thank you. Yeah, that'd be great. I just, and going into next year, it would just be helpful to see, particularly if we're going to increase the resources this year, next year might actually be the perfect time to do that, right? And, and you know, once we can see, um, again, what the increased services have, have um, done for the department, do you need more of those? But then also, again, to take an average of the last few years of what that offset would look like, I think having those numbers in front of us next year would be really helpful. So thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Rocker. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, Council Mahoney. Um, thank you. Um, excellent idea, Council Ann. So <laughs> I know you do. I know you do. Um, I have a couple of quick questions. So summertime help. Um, 
Uh, let's just, just go backwards for a second. How many employees do you have in the cemetery? Just out of curiosity, how many people do we employ? There are currently 14, 1139 workers, um, and there's one um, QPA worker who works in the office. So 39, or I'm sorry, what did you say? 1139, local 1139. So 14 11. that work in the cemetery and one that works in the office. Okay. And then summer help, um, how many people do you get typically for the summer help? Uh, it depends on the circumstances. I think last year we put on additional summer help because we had um, a couple of uh, injuries uh, during the course of the year. So we put on, I think, additional summer help uh, last year. I can get you a specific number, Council, but I don't have it in front of me. Okay. And then, because I know a lot of other towns do that too, they hire like, you know, get kids that will go on rake or just do extra work during the summer. It's just a great way to kind of help out the people that are working in the cemetery department. So, um, then that you had down here, I think it's the grounds, ground, um, ground keeping supplies at thirty thousand dollars. Is that where you're talking about the barrels? Yes, that was an issue that we had identified um, even prior to the hearing that we had um, as something that didn't uh, comport with the rest of the uh, cemetery. There were, uh, in addition to the fifty-five gallon drums, there was a series of aluminum barrels, and it just didn't look nice at so all. So that's how, that's a question that I would have. I mean, thirty thousand dollars is it's it's not a substantial amount of money, but um, but I do know like I wasn't here for the for the vote for Pine Hill. I know that other communities are using their COVID money to enhance their cemetery because it's, it's it's something that happened during COVID. A lot of people are being buried. Thirty thousand dollars is something that we could definitely use to purchase things for the cemetery. Um, I'm going to ask a cut of that thirty thousand dollars. Just because I know that we could use the COVID, the ARPA money, it's a one-time supply line item for that. Those are the places that we could be using these things. It's not really meant for salaries, but that's something that we could be using that for. Um, there's many other places that we could as well, but that's definitely one. So I'm going to make a motion to cut that $30,000 with the anticipation that it would be picked up out of the, um, the ARPA money. So for a cut of $30,000 to $540600, that's a motion. To cut thirty thousand dollars from uh, the groundskeeping supplies line. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Can, can, you, can, you do that? can you do that if there's already been a motion? Well, she's made a motion to cut, so she's adding, making an amendment to the motion. So this would be on the amendment. Okay, so the the, the motion is on. Yes. So That's when, okay. in fact, this is cut. Can, uh, I don't know, whoever's in charge of or responsible has control of ARPA money, will this money be allocated from there for this line item in particular? Um, I would go, that would be uh, the mayor's office. Through you, Mr. Chairman, I, we couldn't make that determination, you know, at this meeting. We would have to take a look at it. And, and sorry, just in it. He said they couldn't make that determination at this meeting. But in addition, did you have a plan going forward to, to cover sort of yearly groundskeeping supplies through this budget? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, yes. Yeah, we have the ability where, to transfer. Did, where did the money for groundskeeping supplies come from before this? This can't be the first request for groundskeeping supplies. We do an, an annual um, uh, appropriation of similar size out of perpetual care, uh, which pays for certain. Um, so can you say that again? You do what? We do, uh, through the uh, Cemetery Board of Managers, um, they oversee the Perpetual Care Fund, and um, they uh, allocate uh, approximately a, a very similar amount for uh, landscaping supplies for the enhancement and improvement of the cemetery, such as uh, loom, uh, flowers, things of that nature. Whether barrels are um, an allowable expense, I'm not certain, um, but certainly, depending on how the council votes, we can look at different options. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, any other, uh, let's give anyone else a chance and then we'll go back to Council Mahoney, who haven't spoke, Council Mahoney. So, yeah, so, uh, but that was my other, my other option was perpetual care, but I would prefer, I, mean, I would hope that the administration would see this as a valuable increase. You just put $16.4 million for Pine Hill Cemetery, which is very close to my heart right now. Um, but COVID money or the perpetual care, which I know that that's something that you have to, much like the um, CPA monies has to be voted on, and I believe it can be used. I know that I looked at into other other communities did use for investments such as that. I just think you didn't have thirty thousand dollars there. It's not much, but it can be found someplace else in your budget for other places. Thank you. Okay, we uh, have the amendment to the motion. We're going to vote on the amendment first. Is there any other councils? Hearing none, um, 
We're going to call a roll on this. Uh, clerk of committees will call the roll. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor DeBona. No. Councilor Liang. Yes. Council Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. No. Chairman Phelan. No. It's tied. It's tied. So the motion it fails. fails. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're back to the original motion, which is to uh, pass the budget. Uh, do we'll do a roll call vote on this one? Sure. Councilor Kane. Uh, yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. No. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Ca uh, Chairman Phelan. Yes. Five members passes. Okay. Five members, the, the cemetery, cemetery passes. So now we're moving on to the parks budget. Okay, give everyone a chance to get there. Um, any councils on the budget? Okay, Council Mahoney. Thank you. So I have a couple of questions, and it's mostly in regards to, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask that we hold on the Parks Department, and maybe um, we could ask Mr. Murphy to come back, potentially even Wednesday night, to give us these answers. But, you know, we're talking about a golf course. We basically said, I think you said there was a $200,000 um, surplus this year. That would be uh, the projection that we've done with the staff in large part uh, due to the timing on how we collect the annual permits of memberships. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't want to set up a uh, completely rosy picture of that should double into a 12 month operation. Yeah. Based on the, um, uh, Diane has done an excellent job of presenting um, the, the profit and loss year to date comparisons uh, coming into the last six months of fiscal 22 and projecting out for fiscal 23. Mm -hmm. And uh, that'll show you that um, a significant uh, portion of the revenue anticipated is from um, the memberships. We were very fortunate in our retention rate with our memberships. I think it was close to 98, 99%. We did lift the caps on the amount of members that we allowed. Um, during the last couple of years, I think the uh, club may have um, kept the um, number of memberships down uh, to make sure that um, the uh, availability of play was more available to the core membership. Uh, but we've lifted uh, the cap on membership, uh, which has increased uh, that dues revenue up to $480,000 per year, um, which is money that uh, is collected whether it rains or not. It's pretty reliable source of base uh, revenue for uh, the golf course. Uh, in addition to that, um, if you look at the projected card fee income and the greens fee income, um, it proje uh, projects a pretty healthy picture for uh, the uh, revenue as it relates to the expenses uh, requested for the Furnacebrook Golf Club. So I guess what I'm asking is that that's all, that's all nice. In the budget, it's not broken out quite like that. So what I, I know when we voted on this last fall, I had a problem because we didn't actually show like what the former organization was doing and what our current aspects would be and how we were going to be able to maintain that. So, you know, what was the original $401,000 spent for? And, you know, how do we itemize that? Basically, what I'm asking for is a presentation just on the golf course. So holding this, I would ask that um, my fellow colleagues hold the parks department and just have you come back on Wednesday night potentially with the presentation, just like you said, just showing us how the revenues are coming in, who we're spending it for, what you know, what our plans are for the golf course. We didn't really break that down last time. It's just something that I find to be difficult to, to follow, like with the regards to the um, administration personnel. Why do we have a superintendent and a golf pro? Do we need both? Is it, is it something that we have to have? We also have, um, you know, we have seasonal help and we have administration assistance. Was that what they had before? Is this something that we came up with? I don't know. I would want that presentation to be made so that we can really have a good understanding of the, of what we're getting involved in with the golf course. It's new. It's something that, that the city hasn't managed before. And these line items are just kind of showing up um, in our budget. And we don't really have a projection as to seeing, you know, where this $1.2 million is being allocated for, how the operations are working, or how, it's, how we're being able to scrutinize it as a, as a city or as a council. The other question that I have is on your golf course maintenance, and I might just not be reading this correctly. Again, it's um, line item 530210. You have a line item for $288,000, and then you have a similar one that says golf course maintenance 540210. So 530, 540 for 229. Like, could you explain to me what those two things are? Sure. One is an expense account and the other is a contractual uh, okay. account. 
and I can certainly break those down for you. For example, the uh, contractual account, um, you know, golf courses have um, what I would describe as a turf management partner that does soil testing, pest management, uh, turf management, uh, seed mixes, fertilizers, uh, yeah. any type of sprays that are necessary to maintain the course. Um, uh, contractual would also pay for uh, security systems at the clubhouse, any equipment rentals that we may have to do um, <coughs> improvements in the course. If we have a, a wet spring and need to do uh, drainage, we may need equipment rentals. Uh, we use Connex boxes currently to help store some of the equipment because the maintenance shed um, is in tough shape. Um, uh, cleaning of the clubhouse after events, uh, we use a contractual service. Uh, our expense lines are everything from sands for the bunkers, uh, loom, soil replenishment, our, our golf, cof, uh, golf cart rentals, uh, mm -hmm. we rent the golf carts, we have a... Um, yeah, a and these are, all, these are all great things, Dave. The, again, I, I, by no means, I, I think it would be best if we could break this out in a separate presentation and have you come back and kind of show us that because lining them up like that is fine, but really have an understanding of like what the membership income that you've brought back in, um, what the value of the restaurant that's going to be coming in, the different things that we're having here. These are just line items right now, but we're not getting a clear view, at least I'm not getting a clear view of how we're operating up there and how we're accounting for it it's not it's part of your department and it's part of our city now but we have to have a better understanding I, I believe I, I I'm, I'm speaking for myself right now not for my fellow colleagues I just believe that it's really not transparent as to how we're operating that and they're line items but you just mentioned a bunch of other things like the fees for the the golf courts the memberships the different things that you're having and the goal I would think would be you know, hopefully, it's, if, it, if it can, it will make money for the city of Quincy. But if, certainly, we don't want to be losing money in the city of Quincy for this as well. And I know that we have, um, you've been having meetings, as you said earlier, with um, the neighbors in regards to up there for the new clubhouse. It's, the, there's going to be an appropriation that's coming before. So now is, the, now is the essence for you to be able to come back with this budget and be able to really explain it to us. And I think if we could hold until Wednesday night, we could probably get those answers. And I'm sure you'd be ready for that by Wednesday night. I just want to make sure, Council, that you saw, we did send out uh, a memo uh, with a packet of support information for the budget. I probably did not see that. <laughs> One of the, um, and Diane did a fantastic job, basically a profit loss statement mm -hmm. uh, of the course. Again, it was a memo, and I, I just, I, I don't think that's transparent for, I did not see it, I apologize. I, I just came up, I'm surfacing back today as, mm -hmm. as, as, far, with, as far as my life kind of went upside down last two weeks but but the reason why i'm saying that is a memo is great to this council to this board but it's not transparent to the general public so the people that i get phone calls from are asking for transparency for this golf course and although it might have broken things out for us which i didn't see i think it would be great if we could have a presentation from you showing us what your anticipations are for the golf course and how we plan on you know moving forward as a city and, and the anticipation revenues that you're going to come in from it and um, probably everything that you had in the memo is just presented to us as, as a as transparently as you can so the taxpayers those interested who are, are tuning in can get that information as well I'll say council. It's a motion to not to, to, to oh, have him come back. I'm sorry. I, I, yeah, I'd like to. I, I I'm it. suggesting that we hold. And I mean, we can certainly ask the rest of the questions. But when it comes to this this particular budget, I'm asking that they come back on Wednesday night. To you want to hold up. the whole budget? Hold it. Just the, yeah. To par park and forestry budget. Okay. There is a motion on the floor to hold the park and forestry department on the motion. Council Yang, and then. Thank you. Um, then, Good evening again. Uh, so I actually, I, I did have a chance to look at the, the email you sent over um, with the profit and loss. It's not as specific as I'd like to see it, but I do appreciate that there is a breakout for projected revenues um, for the next fiscal year. I, I actually, even with addition to this though, um, in, in having this on hand, I would still actually like to have the request to hold off until Wednesday, but for different reasons, right? I'm looking at the total revenues that are anticipated coming in um, and it's in excess of if I'm doing the math correctly and I'm adding up all of um, the items in here that we have as an increase because of the golf course, we're looking at, um, my math here is 809,360 as an addition to this budget. And then the projected revenues are actually over that um, for 853,360. So that's great, right? Because then in my head, that means that the cost to run it is going to be less than what we anticipate coming in to offset it. And this goes back to the question I have with the the cemetery department, which is then I would actually appreciate, since we have a hard number, right, and this isn't similar to um, the cemetery request where we don't know necessarily what that offset would look like yet, we actually do know what the golf course offset would look like, I would actually like to have the 
5,360 built into this budget as an offset to reflect properly in here, right? Because again, it's, it's, it's not unlike the parking, right, conversation where we have um, a number that we're budgeting for that we had to pay for if we vote for this um, for certain needs in TPAL, but then we also see that we have an offset of $400,000 coming in to offset it. So the number at the end of the day is less with the offset. And I think that would be helpful to then include that in this budget to be reflected as well. Again, because we have you know, an exact projected number in here. So if that isn't something we could do tonight, I would like to see that reflected before we move forward on it. I think, again, it's, you put in the work, right? You put in the anticipated revenue we see here. So similar to the other departments, when we project certain revenues and we insert it as an offset, it does change the line item. I'm sorry, the, um, it does change the bottom line at the end of the day that we're voting on. And so I think it just makes sense logistically to do that for this as well. Um, that being said, this request isn't, you know, a, a reflection on you, Commissioner. It's a reflection on just the logistics here. I, I think it just makes sense for us to vote on something where we know we're going to have the potential for an offset. Um, that's what I would feel comfortable moving forward with. As far as your management style goes, I think I shared this uh, with you the other day, and I'd like to share this with folks as well. I, it, this isn't a question of your management, right? I, I, I was not in Quincy. I was in another city and, you know, was talking to some folks about how cities and towns are run. Um, and about three or four people at the table, not from Quincy, not related to Quincy at all, um, probably don't know much about, you know, what we do here, uh, were commenting about how Randolph uh, messed up. Um, they didn't use such kind words, right? They used a little bit of curse words, how Randolph really messed up uh, with letting you go and losing you. And that gave me immense pride to know that we gained you, right, when they're sitting here saying, you know, Randolph really had a huge loss. So again, this isn't a question of your management. In fact, I think it's a reflection of your great management, the fact that you do have projected revenue already for next year for the golf course to offset these costs, let's put it into the budget, you know, and I think that should be reflected. So um, again, I, I second and support Councillor Maloney's request um, for logistical reasons. I think if that dramatically changes the bottom line, um, then that's, that's what we should do. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dave. And Come. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Council Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, even, even going further on that, why is this not an enterprise account? I, I think that's a discussion. Um, maybe Mr. Mason. If we want to keep things tackle. clean, I mean, we, right, and separate, and and we talked about a, and costs. We talked about a number of uh, different issues, and I think there are arguments in favor and against um, by enterprise account and general fund account. Um, okay. And we kicked around quite a bit before choosing the general fund account. Yeah, no, because I appreciate I appreciate the comments from my colleagues. I mean, it makes total sense if we're bringing in revenues to offset the cost of this thing, and you know, we've got questions on why we've got positions, and you know, why not just turn it into an enterprise where we can just monitor the 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 P and L essentially. So, um, yeah, no, I mean, I'm in favor of holding it. So you're going to come back Wednesday and give a presentation. I guess that includes the information that you've already sent us, um, and then what more. I just want to be sure that, especially for my colleague, that she's got all the information that she needs to make an informed decision, um, because I'm willing to bet she's going to vote against it anyway. So, um, I don't, you know, we do this, we do this, we do, we do, we do this with everything. So it's, you know, beat it up presentation. I'm not speaking for anyone, but I'm just saying, you know, we could either go through the line items tonight on that uh, spreadsheet that you sent to us, or we could hold it and okay. to come back once it's no big deal uh I, I appreciate the presentation no matter well well it, if the chair might it's always been a tradition that the first time in yeah. if the council requested that we hold it so um I, I don't want if I, if I could, I'm looking for a presentation that we can you. show the general public at home, not just a memo, because, you know, quite honestly, we should be able to present this in a professional way that we can, you know, a memo's great, I mean, but I don't want a memo. I want the details that go along with that. And I haven't decided if I'm going to vote against it. I've been very accommodating tonight, no, that's, that's Mr. Okay. Kane, but I appreciate the fact that you think you know where I'm standing. Um, maybe you can stand with me, too. I'm going to go next. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Council Yang. So just another follow-up question, if we're going to um, have the presentation, just because, you know, I've said it enough that I think it probably irritates people now, but, you know, being from the restaurant business, we'd love to uh, see a breakout of um, what the, essentially the profits, anticipated profits we're going to see from the restaurant up there, um, and also uh, just, you know, information about the services that could be found up there, what folks can anticipate as far as going up there and grabbing some food, is it just, you know, a restaurant destination as well, um, just kind of what accommodations are provided for that, and then... Um, the associated costs with running it, and then how many of those costs, or how much of those costs are coming out from the city, or not at all, if they're coming out, like, it, it was independently run, essentially, right? So if it's not, that's fine, um, but I would love to dive into that specific element of it, um, 
And then just for clarification, should I follow up? I guess, I'm sorry, you're standing up here and I'm sort of asking like three people yeah. these questions, either to Mr. Yep. Mason, Mr. Walker. Um, who should I follow up with with the, with the offset and uh, in, in putting the offset in there? Yes. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do we, you, just, just a quick housekeeping, then I'll go to you, Council. Um, Jen, you got all that? Yes. <laughs> so we can send questions that, that, that what, that's so what we're looking for. So I'll Mr. Murphy, okay. Thank you. Does, okay, good Council Just Mahoney. That, that was the golf course, and I had a couple, a couple of other questions. I think you said that, did you say that they're, you're hiring more people for the downtown? Um, just for clarification, I didn't quite catch that, so. I, I, you might not have said that. Yeah, there's a shift in a position um, that'll result in, um, so the downtown is taking over a lot of the responsibilities that the park department used to handle out here in and around the, the mall. So we had an open position, um, a working foreman heavy MEO position that had was shifting and putting under control of the downtown as a mechanical technical uh, technician position. So it's the same number of positions. We're shift, shifting it from um, parks into the downtown coordinator. So how many how many employees will you now have in the downtown? Downtown has the downtown coordinator. This will be three mechanical technicians, a horticultural laborer, and a handyman laborer, and those are split 50% uh, between this budget and public buildings. This budget, what other budget? The public buildings. Public buildings, okay. If we could get a more, I just want a little more detail on that as well. And um, then you also mentioned, I think was it the, tr um, I know you mentioned Forbes Hill Park, so I guess I'm confused by that because I think you might have been talking about the tree pruning maybe? Yes. And um, you added $100,000 to tree pruning because of, um, because of Forbes Hill or because no. of other situations with the city? There's, there's two issues there, Councillor. One is that uh, we have a substantial backlog um, of uh, tree requests uh, that we're looking to catch up on. Um, mm -hmm. The other piece is we have a number of uh, parks, um, like Forbes Hill is a, is a good example, um, where we have uh, issues that we haven't um, done really any maintenance uh, mm -hmm. in some of those wooded areas. They're overrun by invasive species. Um, there's a lot of uh, dead and uh, mm -hmm. potentially dangerous trees in some of these areas that we couldn't get uh, vehicles into. We need tree climbers to get into. So that's why we would use outside uh, contracted um, yeah. services there and not simply back up our crews to it. $100,000, I mean, that's, I, I, I actually agree with that because you, there's trees over at the um, Shea Park. <laughs> dead trees there. There's dead trees everywhere. I mean, it's, it, I'm not sure how you do keep up with that, but it, that, that was, brings me back to a similar request that's been being asked by the Quincy Tree Alliance for quite some time, and I'm not sure where you stand on this, and you might actually have it done, so this is just really a question. Um, the inventory of our trees, I know you mentioned you just put in 500 plus trees, but we also have trees throughout the city. I would hope that, you know, when you're adding the tree pruning of $100,000, you'd be able to tell me what parks that we do need to have these done in, because I can tell you that as you know, I like to do. I like to go walk in my parks and see the parks and see the problems that we're having. And we have a lot. And you know, this is a hundred thousand dollars that probably won't, it probably won't go too far. So I guess I'm looking to find out where's that inventory of trees. So we have a um, one of the items um, in the uh, email I sent out uh, was relative to a uh, website that we're going to launch with the help from our GIS coordinator Steve Washburn at DPW, mm -hmm. um, and I think it's going to be uh, something that we are all going to be very proud of. It's uh, modeled after Seattle, Washington's uh, urban forestry management uh, mm -hmm. website, uh, and I attached a link uh, to that email. Um, it essentially inventories all of our trees, uh, their species, uh, the species, the height. Uh, the condition um, and talks about uh, what the city needs to do. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got elements of that already put together from the work that our former tree warden, uh, Chris Haywood, had done, uh, but we need to uh, increase the, the data within um, the inventory itself. We still got work to do. Again, um, not a, this might sound like it's crazy, it's really, it's really just when you're adding numbers like that, $100,000 into your budget, I get concerned because we don't see that inventory and I think that's part of the key of what you're trying to maintain, so. Yeah, one of, the, one of the support pieces I sent out was the, the map um, of the, I think it's 417 outstanding resident requests we have right now uh, mm -hmm. that uh, we can fulfill some of that with our own in-house crews, uh, but we're going to need some supplemental resources to make a dent in that. Yeah, I'm sure I'll catch up on my emails by Wednesday. But <laughs> Understood. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate okay. it. Um, the chair will just take a moment of privilege. Uh, how, how are we doing on the tree warden, Davis? I, I want to just say some great things about Chris Edward who was there working. It was a great pleasure to work with him. He really was a professional. He knew what he was doing. But I think I've also got calls from neighbors who were concerned 
that they want the next person to have the similar qualifications to uh, what Chris had. Mm -hmm. So how are we doing with hiring the new tree warden? So qualifications we can replace, his personality would be impossible to replace. Um, you know, we have um, uh, an offer to um, an existing uh, certified tree warden from another municipality. Um, I expect to uh, have an answer and close uh, that this week. Um, but, you know, Chris was uh, excellent um, at working with the public and uh, visiting front porches. And, you know, there are a lot of people that want trees down that, you know, that aren't dead. So uh, he had a good way of working through some difficult situations. So uh, I anticipate, uh, I, I've received a lot of those emails, as I know the whole council has, relative to about um, replacing Chris. And you know, we can certainly find um, another certified tree warden um, to take the position. I don't know that we're ever going to find somebody to take his place only because of um, uh, the way he handled his business. He was one of a kind. So that's in the, in the process right now. Yeah, we're very close. Okay. Um, and just one other thing on a uh, great job on Butler's Pond, but now I want to see Sailor's Pond done. So. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm speaking for the neighbors in that area. They all want to see it done. I think it was a great, did a great job with Butler's. Learned a lot, I think, doing it. And uh, now you're ready to do sailors, right? <laughs> okay. Um, that's all I got. And this budget, any other councils? This budget is on hold. So um, I'll ask Jen Manning to get you the questions that came up. And if you can do that for the presentation, uh, that would be good. Okay, and then next up is going to be the recreation department. Motion, motion has been made to approve. Uh, any any anyone to speak on the motion? Just say, Michelle. The reason you're getting this is you do a great job every year, and your department does an excellent job in keeping things running. Seeing what ha went on with the Senior Olympics, it's not just for the young kids; it's also for some of us old timers. And <laughs> we we certainly appreciate the work you and your staff do, and it's a great, great job. And uh, Councilor Leanne, I just want to also add on that um, you know we're talking so much about engagement, transparency, and all that. You do such a phenomenal job making sure that we're all up to date with every single like way to participate. Um, and I just so appreciate that, right? Because like, there's a million things happening um, and we're always trying to keep up with trying to get things out to our constituents about all the amazing things happening across the city um, and the amount of emails and information I get. Keep them coming because you do a phenomenal job keeping us up to date with what's going on. Um, again, just you know, opportunities that you know, residents can come and participate in different things that you put on as well. So thank you for always engaging us in, in all of the work that you do. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. okay, we have a motion to approve. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Um, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Um, that, that's, that concludes the business. Public, public buildings will be on Wednesday night and also emergency management. So I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn.